isn't just about some impact at the corporate level. This is really about having an impact at a personal level. For myself, I identify as an engineer. I really want to be able to come into my company, Spotify, and figure out how to have an impact beyond recycling, biking to work, all those sorts of things. They're great, but when you can have an impact that goes global, the path to impact is as important as the destination. Okay, guys, may I just ask, could everyone please have their phone be silent in airplane mode? You may not know that uh, Spotify is in fact a Swedish-based company, and in Sweden, sustainability is really part of the cultural consciousness. For Spotify, we have decided that we want to contribute positively to climate change. We started with the Exponential Roadmaps goal, which is to get to zero carbon emissions by 2050. Our goal is actually to get to zero emissions by 2030. In 2021, we released our Global Equity and Impact Report, and in that, we outline our path towards net zero for greenhouse gas emissions. One of the things that is part of that playbook that I love the best is our annual Hack Week. So Hack Week is when the entire company comes together to figure out how to innovate across the company. So this year, we set the theme of Hack Week to making the planet cooler. One of the first and most basic things is, of course, we have moved everything to the cloud. With Google, we have the opportunity to leverage uh, a number of products that help us in our technology approach to climate change. And we do uh, auto scaling with uh, products like Bigtable, like GKE. There's a few things that are really at the core of our strategy. One, we want to have a direct reduction of our own greenhouse gas emissions. The cloud part of the emissions was only a small part of the equation. It starts not just from the the cloud, but it goes all the way out to our end user devices. The second part is to take a look at the emissions caused by all the things that are upstream from us that we use. Not only will we reduce our own emissions, but we'll have a side effect to all the other companies who are using these same providers. And then the third part is really to leverage our unique position to be able to influence people's behaviors outside of Spotify. In particular, uh, not surprisingly, since I lead a group of developers and engineers, to really be able to impact the environment as well. Hi, Tyson. Hi, Max. Uh, Max, before we get started, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how you got into engineering. I think it's a very fascinating way of trying to understand and structure the world. How did you get started with engineering? <laughs> I got started with engineering as a, a young man. Uh, my dad was actually a software engineer. My dad was also, or is, a, is an engineer uh, as well. So maybe that's uh, a common pattern that you choose from your parents. I'd love to hear what sustainability means to you personally. Yeah, I am personally worried about where we are. I just felt my anxiety increase with regards to climate change. And um, I realized that by taking small personal steps, that that kind of milders my anxiety. So we recently had our hack week and the theme was making the planet cooler. Uh, you participated in that, but this was actually the genesis of the Climate Engineering Handbook. Just in a nutshell, can you define what the Climate Engineering Handbook really is? Today it has two parts. So it starts with a theoretical part that discusses where our emissions primarily stem from, device, CDN, networking, and cloud. So we discuss these chapters and, and from a theoretical perspective try to show where the emissions come from in each of these separate steps. And then um, there is a second part of the handbook, which is a much more hands-on guide uh, discussing what tangible steps you can take um, in each of these disciplines. In this overall process, really a sort of a bottoms-up process to democratize access and then action, tell us a little bit about how you think this will evolve over time. Amazing to see how many people at Spotify actually care deeply about this topic. I think the only thing that's limiting us right now is just people hearing about it. Well, thanks, Max, for being a climate champion uh, for Spotify and hopefully for the world. Thank you. How are you doing? Great. 
First, can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at Spotify? So here at Spotify, I lead business development for Backstage, focusing on driving strategic partnerships and other opportunities that improve the adopter experience. So what is Backstage? Yeah, Backstage is an open platform for building developer portals. It was built internally at Spotify, open sourced in 2020, and we donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And what's a developer portal? A developer portal is a single plane of glass for your entire infrastructure. So it unifies your tooling, your services, docs, and apps under a unified, consistent UI. So we have these different plugins that they work with Backstage there was a plugin that came out. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it does? So Cloud Carbon Footprint is actually an open source tool developed by ThoughtWorks. It leverages cloud APIs to provide visualizations of estimated carbon emissions on usage across Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure. We want to empower not just Spotify internally, but the broader developer community to be able to immediately measure, understand, and reduce their carbon footprint. Do you think that this has opened the floodgate for more possibilities? There's so much more to come. We believe that climate change isn't going to come from a single silver bullet to solve the problem. Instead, it's going to come from people who are united to make a lot of changes. Engineers, at quite a personal level, they want to have a big impact. It's not just about what we can do to reduce our company's global greenhouse emissions, but what we can do to help everybody else have that same impact. Hello, everyone. We're so happy to have you here with us today at the Google Cloud Sustainability Summit. It's no secret how important sustainability efforts are to organizations, individuals, our communities, and especially our planet. We all feel the urgency to address climate change. But so often, determining the most impactful steps holds people and organizations back from taking action. That's why I'm proud to be a part of Google, where sustainability has been a core value from the very beginning of our company. We believe in a world where every cloud user, from employees and executives to developers and technologists can build and work more sustainably. And everything we build and design is rooted in helping our customers and partners take action to create a more sustainable future. Throughout this summit, you'll have a chance to learn from leaders who share our vision for a more sustainable future. We'll showcase our latest Google Cloud product innovations, demonstrate how they can help you reduce your environmental impact, and showcase stories from businesses that are using technology to meet their sustainability goals. As I meet with organizations around the world, it's clear that sustainability is a top business priority. In particular, we see two major trends emerge. First, consumers, employees, investors, and policymakers are demanding that organizations prioritize sustainability and be transparent about the impact they're having on the environment and the progress they're making on their sustainability initiatives. Second, three of every four executives believe that sustainability can be a growth engine for their business. The cloud is a core of that transformation. With these two trends converging, we're entering a new era of business transformation driven by sustainability. Companies that embrace sustainability as a core value to their business will likely be the ones that succeed. For example, in retail, the companies that deliver sustainable products and align their brand values with sustainability are able to better serve today's consumers that are interested in buying and supporting eco-friendly brands. Similarly, the consumer packaged goods companies 
that put responsible sourcing insights directly into the hands of their procurement teams can create supply chains more resilient to raw material shortages and climate-related threats. Financial services institutions that can more accurately understand climate risk are better able to direct capital to climate smart investments. We know that this is hard to do alone. While we're proud to run the cleanest cloud in the industry, we're even more inspired by the work our partners and customers are doing with Google Cloud to help our customers bring their sustainability priorities to life. To showcase the expertise of the partners that offer sustainability solutions on Google Cloud, we're introducing a new Google Cloud Ready sustainability designation. This designation will make it easier for our customers to identify partner solutions that we've verified. These solutions are now available in our new sustainability hub on Google Cloud Marketplace, where our customers can quickly find the right partner solution to address their climate-related challenges. I'd like to thank all of our partner sponsors for their support of this event, especially our premier sponsors, including Carto, Climate Engine, Geotab, and NGIS. Each of these partners already has the new Google Cloud Ready Sustainability designation, and you will hear more about them later today. We hope this summit inspires you to act now. We support and applaud your efforts to set new goals, engage your leaders or board members to make transformational decisions and focus on sustainability across your organization. Thank you for joining us. Before I turn it over to Kate Brand, Alphabet's Chief Sustainability Officer, here is a story of a company using cloud technology to transform one of the world's oldest industries, farming. Farmers, they have an interest in sustainability, but what's been lacking historically for growers is having the data and the tools that they need to be able to do that well. And that's the reason we're so excited to work with farmers to give them the guidance that'll help them succeed. I'm Tyler. I'm Adam. And we're the co-founders of Agrology. We'd been kicking around the idea of how do we use a lot of different sensors and machine learning and sensor fusion to deliver predictive insights to our growers to thrive in a changing climate. Traditionally, growers, they try to do these predictions themselves, but they can't be on every inch of every farm every day. They also have to deal with a climate that's changing on them that makes every year harder and less predictable. We use TensorFlow and Google Cloud to train the models that take our data streams and turn it into predictions for our customers. The aha moment for us was when we first saw the results and predictions for the first growing season. That was huge. If we can tell a grower if their crops are at risk of stress or if they're approaching some irrigation thresholds, we can warn them if they're approaching wilting point in a particular area of their field. The process for preparing to work with farmers is first jumping onto Google Earth so we can understand their land. And then we have to think about where we could put our devices in their fields to deliver them insights. Our app takes data from our sensor arrays in the soil and in the air, and it runs it through our machine learning models to make predictions to warn farmers about problems before they emerge. The synthetic models we generate, the forecast models we generate, it's just impossible without TensorFlow, without Google Cloud taking all the data from every block, from every site, and forecasting that three to four days out. That's just something that you're not going to be able to duplicate with a single human being. Giving growers the tools to actually see what's happening in their field is the key to helping them be more sustainable. It's thrilling and it makes the journey and the challenges worthwhile. Thank you so much, Thomas. I am absolutely thrilled to be here at the first ever Cloud Sustainability Summit. Cloud technology from companies like Agrology is proving to be a powerful tool in the fight against climate change, as we just saw from farmers like Riggs. This summit is a tremendous opportunity for 
everyone to share ideas and experiences so that we can work together to build a more sustainable future. So today you're gonna to hear from technologists, scientists, and business leaders who understand the urgency that we face. Their climate ambitions are meeting the magnitude of the moment, and we could not be more excited to have them here with us every day. People are using Google to search for information on climate change and ways that they can take action. Every day, we talk to customers trying to prioritize climate projects. And every day, we work with developers wondering how to apply their skills to create more sustainable applications. But as Thomas mentioned, we know most people, they aren't really sure where to start. So we wanna help both individuals and organizations find their way forward. And at Google, we are committed to sharing our technology, methods, and funding to help organizations everywhere to transition to a resilient and carbon-free operation. So when we think about our strategy, we have three pillars that really guide our sustainability efforts. This is how we think about it across the company. And it really builds on a very long history of innovation. So first, it really starts with pushing the boundaries across our own operations and value chain. Like a growing number of companies, we have set some very ambitious goals around our own emissions. But it's more than this. It's second that we are focused on supporting partners. This is governments, nonprofits, and multinational corporations we are offering them technology that they need to scale up their own solutions and meet their climate action goals. And then third, we are working to make the sustainable choice the easiest choice for everyone who uses our core products at Google. Sustainability, it has been truly a core value for us as a company since our founding. This goes all the way back to 2007, when we were the first major company to be carbon neutral for our operations. And then just 10 years later, we were able to match 100% of our annual electricity consumption with renewable energy for the first time. And this is now something we have done every year since. So today we find ourselves in our third decade of climate action, and we are raising that bar again. So we have set a goal to achieve net zero emissions across all of our operations and value chain, and we'll do that by 2030. We aim to reduce the majority of our emissions before 2030, and then we plan to invest in nature-based and technology-based carbon removal solutions to neutralize the rest of our emissions. And a key way that we are going to achieve net zero is by operating on 24 by seven carbon-free energy. So that this means is that by 2030, our hope is that every email you send, every question you ask Google search, every virtual machine you spin up across all of our platforms, this will be supplied by carbon-free energy every hour of every day. This latest moonshot, it's gonna require us to add new energy technologies to our portfolio. So this is why we've made some recent investments in areas like geothermal and battery technology. It also requires us to work closely with our global partners to advocate for policies that accelerate grid decarbonization for everyone. And we must continue to share insights and to collaborate with other organizations who are committed to 24 by seven carbon free energy. So that is why I am very pleased to announce that we will be sharing 24 by seven carbon free energy insights with our cloud customers. Now these insights will bring tooling and data analysis that we've built over the last 10 years on our own journey. Now we can help organizations to achieve 24 by seven alongside the work that we've done. So really I would say sharing knowledge is key to helping everyone to reach those ambitious net zero targets that we have set. And so we've been focused on sharing that knowledge for a long time. Years ago, Google was approached by scientists in the Brazilian Amazon, and they were recognizing the loss of millions of acres of Amazonian rainforest due to deforestation. And so they wanted to know 
Could Google help them do anything to help tackle this huge challenge they faced? And fortunately, Google actually had years of satellite imagery and the computing power to process it. So we started providing access to this data to help scientists that wanted to utilize this information to detect changes in the Amazon, to map trends, and to quantify differences on the Earth's surface. So this was actually the beginning of Google Earth Engine. And now people across the world rely on this platform. Scientists can accurately track how the natural environment is changing over time. Researchers can model how land cover change is happening or predict weather patterns under different climate scenarios. So for over 10 years, Google Earth Engine has built a community of proven use of better data about the natural world. And together with compute power and analytics, machine learning, this is an impressive combination for making breakthroughs in our climate fight. So you may wonder, how does this support businesses and governments? They obviously need this power too. So I am very excited to announce that Google Earth Engine is now generally available on Google Cloud to all of our customers. You can apply Earth Engine to your most difficult climate questions using one of the world's largest planetary data sets. So when you combine Earth Engine with powerful analytics, machine learning tools, I would say there are really few limits to the impact that you can have. And we have cloud customers today like Unilever that are already using Earth Engine to generate insights that help their organization make more responsible sourcing decisions for areas like palm oil. And they're now partnering more intentionally with local communities and producers who supply it. Government agencies like the US Forest Service are also using Earth Engine on Google Cloud. They are studying the effects of climate change like fires and insect-borne disease to ensure that they can best protect our forests in the future. Earth Engine on Google Cloud is an incredibly powerful and unique tool. It can accelerate fundamental changes in the way we source materials, use natural resources, model climate risk, and build resilience. But I'm happy to say we are not stopping here. For every individual developer and IT organization using Google Cloud, we are also continuing to invest in making it easier to build sustainably. Sustainability is really becoming a responsibility of developers and IT. And they're being asked to implement scalable solutions to help their company make progress against sustainability goals. So we believe our customers should not only have comprehensive and accurate pictures of their carbon impact of the cloud services they use, but also have the ability to act now, right at their fingertips. So last year, we introduced the first product in our Carbon Sense suite, Carbon Footprint. And we embedded these sustainability features natively into Google Cloud so that you don't need to, by any means, be an environmental expert to build like one. So this suite of services it helps track and reduce the gross carbon emissions associated with using Google Cloud right from the console. I'm excited to share that we've added scope one and scope three emissions to carbon footprint. So every user now can have the most complete measure of their Google Cloud carbon footprint available in the market. This means customers now have direct access to reporting that includes gross emissions before we then do mitigation and offsets, and the indirect emissions from our supply chain. We have also introduced a new feature to the Carbon Sense suite that's called Low Carbon Mode. Now, this allows administrators to easily set policies that can automatically restrict a company's cloud resources to the lowest carbon cloud region across Google Cloud infrastructure. So setting defaults can really just simplify the number of priorities put on developers while still ensuring the apps they build run on as low carbon infrastructure as possible. So for organizations where digital infrastructure is a considerable part of their supply chain footprint, prioritizing sustainable infrastructure, this can really make a huge difference. Salesforce is a customer of ours who faces this exact challenge. 
they have worked hard to prioritize low carbon infrastructure and expect to reduce their yearly gross emissions of certain workloads by roughly 80% with Google Cloud. Now, my friend and colleague, Patrick Flynn, has been instrumental in Salesforce's transformation. So let's watch. Thanks, Kate. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here today. As Kate mentioned, I'm Patrick Flynn, Global Head of Sustainability at Salesforce, and I work for Planet Earth. To me, climate change is the biggest, most important, and most complex challenge humans have ever faced. And whether or not you realize it, you are being called to an epic adventure, rising to meet the climate crisis head on. Here at Salesforce, where sustainability is one of our core values, we are dedicated to accelerating the world's largest organizations to net zero, driving the trillion trees movement, and igniting an ecopreneur revolution. We've achieved net zero residual emissions across our full value chain, reached 100% renewable energy for our global operations, and we're nearly halfway towards our 100 million tree goal. At this critical point in time, everyone is being called on to focus on what they do best. Everyone must use their superpower. Google is using its own superpowers like data, energy, and computing to do more for the climate action movement than ever before. And we at Salesforce are using our technology superpowers to help our customers navigate successfully through the sustainability revolution, particularly with net zero cloud, your single source of truth for your carbon emissions data. Our journey doesn't stop there. Salesforce and Google are partners in this climate adventure and something really incredible happens when two companies use their complementary resources for climate action. You see, so often we've had to bring energy to the work firewood chopped and carried to where the heat was needed, fossil fuels refined and pumped to your gas tank. But now with digital work, we have the opportunity to move the work at the speed of light to where the energy is most reliable, most secure, and most importantly, cleanest. The engineers at Salesforce looked at the data provided by the Carbon Sense suite of products in the Google Cloud platform to help us identify opportunities to move workloads to cleaner grids, reducing the carbon impact of those applications by 80%, all while still delivering the same work. Data is critical, especially greenhouse gas data. Overnight, Every organization's greenhouse gas emissions data is going to need to look like the quality of its financial data in terms of trust, timeliness, and comparability. That's why Salesforce built Net Zero Cloud to measure and manage your greenhouse gas data, and most importantly, to help you know what action to take. The time for bold action is now. I hope you'll join me, Salesforce, and Google on our climate journey. You are already part of this adventure. So choose to do business with suppliers and customers who are serious about climate. Go net zero now, 100% renewable, and join the global Trillion Trees movement at 1T.org. Thanks again to you all and to Google for the ongoing partnership. Now, let's do great things together. Salesforce is a great example of how organizations are accelerating unprecedented change with cloud technology. Change is not only happening at the platform level, it is also happening in the way that we work. So with Google Workspace, we're enabling everyone to transition to hybrid and to connect, to create and to collaborate, whether you're working from home, the office or anywhere in between. And for every stand-up meeting without a commute, 
every transatlantic conversation without a flight, the emissions associated with your individual work can drop really dramatically. However, it is important to remember that emissions, they do exist even with virtual work. And so this is why I am very happy to announce that we will be launching Carbon Footprint for Google Workspace early next year. Google Workspace customers will be able to track and report the gross emissions associated with products that we all love, like Meet, Gmail, and more, and then equipping them with accurate data to make more informed decisions toward their sustainability goals. And customers will be able to filter the information by a chosen timeframe and then export their data. When you do need to commute, you can now use eco-friendly routes in Google Maps. There have already been 86 billion miles traveled on eco-friendly routes in both the US and Canada. And this has already saved an estimated half a million metric tons of emissions. That's roughly the equivalent to taking 100,000 cars off the road. And we are only getting started. So when you use Google products, build on Google Cloud, and collaborate with Google Workspace, you can be confident that you are working on the cleanest cloud in the industry. And with new products and features that you saw here today, you can act to reduce your carbon footprint, increase your climate resilience, and meet your sustainability goals. The urgency of addressing climate change demands much more from all of us. The way that we meet the scale of this challenge is to continue to increase the scale of our ambitions. So from the Moonshot Factory here at Google, to developers from Spotify, to leaders from the UN, our hope here today is to inspire action. So let's get inspired by our next guest, an astrophysicist, scientist, author, and educator, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil has recorded a special segment on his Star Talk podcast with a very special guest, and they'll be discussing the complex realities of climate science and how to communicate the urgency of taking action. So let's check it out. This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And hello to all you Google Cloud Sustainability Summit attendees. I'm delighted to be speaking with you. I'm here with my comedic co-host, Chuck Nice. Chuck. Hey, hey, hey all Neil. All right. Host of Brain Games. It was on Nat Geo, but Disney want Nat Geo. So now you got to hop on Disney Plus and there he is. Yep. And, and I, I still get the same amount of money. I did. It didn't matter. It didn't, didn't matter. make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> and you're also a climate activist on your own. This is great. And I've got with us climate scientist, Kate Marvel. Kate, uh, this is not your first rodeo with Star Talk. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back. Yeah. Yeah. Research scientist at NASA GISS, G-I-S-S, the Goddard Institute for space studies, and you're also a research scientist at Columbia, and loving your PhD uh, in theoretical particle physics from Cambridge University. Loving it. You were just done with that, right? And you say, okay, uh, let me let me pick up a hard problem <laughs> to solve. Yeah, that's how badass I am. I got bored with theoretical <laughs> particle <laughs> physics. <laughs> so this is a Cosmic Queries edition of Star Talk, and it's a fan favorite of all the ways we bring Star Talk to the public. But in, in this format, we take questions normally from our audience. But for this special segment, we're going to have questions that Google has heard from all of you at the Google Cloud Sustainability Summit. And they're all about climate change. And I've got them right here on the list in front of me. So let's jump right in it. So Kate, just uh, remind us what you do in a day. Sure. Um, so I'm a climate modeler. I work with climate models, which are basically toy planets that you put on computers. Um, and the cool thing about climate models is that they are literally world building machines. Um, they help you understand the world that we live in. They help you understand what it would be like if things were otherwise. And they let you look at different what ifs. And Kate, we, we know because we, we learn this in movies. If you have the power to create a world, you have the power to destroy one. Uh. <laughs> with with that power comes great responsibility. So uh, how do you think of Marvel? 
I'm speaking of Marvel. <laughs> so, Kate, where do you get your data from? And then how do you invoke it in the models themselves? So a model is just physics. Um, it just expresses what we know about how air and water and ice and land all react and, and interact with each other. So at its very, very basic core, a climate model is just basically Newton's laws of motion. You know, F equals MA, energy conservation, mass conservation. So it's basic physics 101. This is like the first month of physics. Basic physics 101. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, and, you know, the, the reason that climate models are so complex, the reason that we have to run them on supercomputers is that there are a lot of things acting under F equals MA. So they're all interacting with each other. You've got, you know, all of these different aspects of the climate system. And that gets really, really complicated. It's just a bunch of differential equations. It's just a bunch of physics. But when you write it all down, those equations get really, really difficult or impossible for a human being to solve. And so you need to solve them on a computer. I got you. And so, and what do satellites do for you? So satellites help give us the data that let us check whether or not our models are credible or not. So we've got an amazing Earth observing system at NASA that's looking at various aspects of, of the climate system. So everything from the temperature to the cloud cover, to the color of the oceans to see what phytoplankton is doing in the oceans. Mm. So we're tracking an incredible amount of data from space. And that gives us ways to test, hey, are things changing in the way that our models say they should be changing? Are there any other organizations that are modeling uh, along with you or in opposition to you? And do you guys share information? Yeah, so there's, there's a bit of a friendly competition with different climate modeling groups. We have, I think, four climate models in the United States. Um, ours at NASA GIS, um, there's one um, at Princeton, one in Boulder, and one developed out of um, the Department of Energy. Um, then there's climate models all over the world. So there's a Japanese climate model, there is a Chinese climate model, there is a British climate model, there's a French climate model. And so what's your competition, just to see who matches the data the best as it comes rolling in, I guess? Well, there's a whole bunch of different ways to be wrong. Um, so I'm not, oh, okay. I think that's really <laughs> tell me Tell me about it. I've been married for 24 okay. years. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so we're not just measuring the average temperature of, of the planet. Um, we're measuring, you know, climate models output an incredible amount of data. You know, right now, I think the current generation of climate models is giving us about 50 petabytes of data. So this is a huge big data. A petabyte is a thousand times bigger than a terabyte. Than a terabyte. Wow. Th a thousand times mm -hmm. bigger than a gigabyte. A thousand times bigger than a megabyte. Yeah. So there we go. We're moving on up. It's, yeah, it's a lot. It's yeah, a lot. Yeah. So, you know, they're giving us not just temperature, but rainfall and cloud cover and soil moisture and ice and all of these different variables that interlock and interact and make up the climate system. So at some point, if all of you start agreeing with each other, that's a good sign because it means that however differently everyone was thinking from each other at the beginning, there's some convergence of an understanding of how the systems work. Is that a fair a fair a prediction for the future? Absolutely. So if all climate models agree on something, that means that the physics is incredibly well understood. So mm. all climate models get warmer in response to elevated carbon dioxide. And that's because the physics of the greenhouse effect is not something that is at all controversial. So how can an organization, which presumably has a little more power and influence than an individual, so how can an organization uh, uh, maybe allocate its time, its money, its effort to mitigate some of what you're, you're, you're trying to understand there. So I love that question. And the reason I love it is I think there's so much emphasis put on the individual. Um, what can individuals do? Do you recycle? Do you buy different light bulbs? And no individual is going to be able to make even a drop in the bucket of climate change. So this is really a systemic problem and we really need systemic solutions. But no individual is completely isolated. Everybody is part of a community. Everybody is part of a church group. Everybody has, you know, most people have employers. And so it's really at that- Interesting. That so the concept started. of an organization here is way beyond just what is the name of your company? It's anything you are a participant in 
is bigger than you are, but you all might have a like mind in order to take action. I think so. Yeah. I think then that can be really powerful because A, you can get stuff done when you band together in larger groups, but also it makes you feel less alone. Um, I talk to a lot of people who are feeling really overwhelmed and really terrified and really anxious. And when you think of just yourself as an individual, of course you feel anxious because what can one individual do with such a big problem? But once you start acting and once you start bringing in other people in your networks, your friend group, your school, whatever, then you start feeling less alone and you start being able to be more effective. Often we see industries that are invested in a, their own carbon footprint or in denial of it. And we have scientists giving these other messages. Do you have any, any advice on how scientists in the corporate world can make nice in the sandbox? I mean, one of the most painful realizations for me as, as a scientist is that data doesn't change people's minds. Um, you know, I have this temptation to show up and when I talk to people say, but I have an equation. Oh, you want to see another equation? You want to see a graph? I have a graph. And that doesn't work. That doesn't change people's minds. Um, I think what changes people's minds are, are stories and stories told by messengers that they trust. Um, and so I realized that there are audiences that I'm not going to be able to talk to. They don't trust me. They don't see me as a welcome messenger. And, and that's okay, because what we need is to get more people involved in talking about climate change. I think that's why it is so important for all of us to talk about this as much as possible, because if people don't listen to me, maybe they'll listen to you. Kate, that's profound. Uh, I, I like the idea of the storytellers who, the trusted storytellers, mm-hmm. uh, we just have to make sure that they are educated in ways that uh, their story has some relationship to an objective reality. Once uh, upon a time, <laughs> there was a planet called Earth. <laughs> Uh, and then I like that story. they had these things called Homo <laughs> sapiens come along, <laughs> and they mucked it all up. <laughs> the end. The end. Okay, one last question. <laughs> we got to uh, keep this tight. How can we communicate the urgency of this without having people throw up their hands? Oh, uh, with without hope. Oh, that's that's good stuff there. <sighs> yeah, that something that I struggle with a little bit, um, because if you say how bad it is, if you say, you know, this is this is really, really serious, this is an existential threat, then yes, people tend to shut down, people tend to get very anxious. Um, and I think the way the, the framing that really works for me is saying, can you imagine how scary climate change would be if we didn't know what was causing it? Can you imagine if there was nothing that we can do about this? That's not true. There is something that we can do about this. You know, I've never thought of it that way, Kate. That's brilliant. It's simple and brilliant at the same time. Uh, Kate, we got to close this out. Give me one, give us a sentence to take us home. You've been wise this entire show. (laughs) Now cap that with another bit of wisdom that'll, that'll take us home. Oh man, no pressure. Um, I would say, um, we are. We are lucky. We are lucky to have been born at this time uh, because we are alive at exactly the right time to change everything for the better. So this has been Star Talk, and a special thank you to Google and to all the attendees at the Google Cloud Sustainability Summit. All right, somebody's got to make a difference here. All right, let's get started any way we can. Mm. And so again, thanks to my co-host Chuck Nice. Always a pleasure. Tweeting at Chuck Nice Comic. Always thank good you. to have you there. And thank you again to our special guest, Dr. Kate Marvel. Kate. Uh, occasionally on Twitter at Dr. Kate Marvel. I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. As always, keep looking up.
Hi folks, I'm really, really excited to be joined here by a great friend, Nigel Topping. I've just heard he's actually has an honorary professorship, so really Professor <laughs> Nigel Topping, one of the two high-level climate champions appointed by the United Nations Climate Conference. Nigel, a very, very big welcome to our first Google Cloud Sustainability Summit. First, congratulations on the huge momentum that you've built in your role as high-level champion. I know that you've only got six months left before you have to hand over the baton. But for those of you who don't know about the role that you've had, could you just tell us a bit about uh, the role? Yeah, well, first of all, Justice, it's great, great to see you and, and, and to join you. Um, and you can call me Nigel. You have to call me Professor Topping. It's okay. Um, uh, yeah, so the, 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 it's, it's an interesting role, but it does bear a bit of explanation. So the, the, the role was created in 2015 as part of the Paris Agreement when all the countries that formed that agreement recognized that national governments can't solve the climate crisis on their own. Um, and so they created a role, which was they called the High Level Climate Action Champion. And the role is given the task to work with everybody else. So businesses, the finance sector, sub-national government, like cities, st like the state of California, it doesn't have a seat at the table in the UN climate process, right? Even though it's the fifth biggest economy in the world. So all of those that the UN calls non-state actors to, to like mobilize them um, to drive more ambition and more action to support countries to go faster. What we refer to as the ambition loop, you know, that the faster the private sector goes, the more it emboldens policymakers. And um, with, with my colleague Gonzalo Munoz last year, we launched two, well, three campaigns to reflect the three legs of the Paris Agreement. Race to Zero, which is about getting to zero as fast as possible with a focus on actions this decade. Race to Resilience, which is about addressing the very real uh, vulnerabilities to lives and livelihoods of people who live on coasts, um, the urban, poor, smallholder farmers around the world. And then with Mark Carney, we launched the Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero to mobilize the trillions of dollars um, that we need. So, so, so that that's the job, really, getting everyone to go faster and, uh, and really focus on short-term action. Fantastic. And Nigel, I know that you and your team have been at the heart of trying to mobilize industry-level transformations. And we heard earlier today that Thomas Kurian, our CEO of Google Cloud, has said that we're entering this new era of sustainability-driven business transformation. You've spoken a lot about mobilizing kind of system-level change in industries. I'd love your view on where we're seeing that kind of transformation and what progress are we making? Well, it, it's, it's interesting that Thomas is... is um using that language because I think it's also a language that some people in, in the sort of governmental or multilateral, like the Secretary General talks about a new form of multilateralism which recognises that, yes, we need nation states who, are, who regulate markets to, to, and, and control a lot of procurement to move, but also we need the sort of innovative power. I mean, you, know, you guys are about as a, a, a sort of the definition of that power to innovate, right, and that commitment to use innovation as a drive for solving problems so i think um what what so that's that's interesting is it what we're i mean when i you know when i was a young man growing up working in industry national governments kind of avoided industrial strategy right it was like free markets to do everything now we realize actually that markets well designed and the private sector working with the public sector can really solve problems much faster and a lot of that involves new types of collaboration i mean some of the ones that um that that, that you know that you're involved in um uh, and we, we launched this idea of breakthroughs at last year in the run-up to COP26 to be very clear on what do we actually need to deliver to, to get on the S-curve. I mean, you know, the, the, your sector understands innovation better than most sectors because you everyone, everyone uh, every, every senior person in your sector has been through multiple disruptive and cycles. And people, right? people are experiencing it firsthand, aren't they? People are interacting yeah. with the technologies that we produce. Right. So, whereas if you're in the if you're in the cement sector or the or, or power utilities or aviation, you you know your business model hasn't changed since the industry was started. In some cases, two thousand years ago, right? So, um, so so that's kind of important is is that that understanding, um, but also that we need to collaborate in different ways. So, like I so said, the first movers coalition, which I know, um, uh, you know, Google's been one of the founding members of, pooling procurement signals. You know, when, when a lot of big players say we're only going to buy um, green steel in the future or we're going to buy um, X gigatons of direct air capture um, uh, uh, carbon credits, um, 
those those things really make a difference. I mean, I mean, I hear from investors and CEOs who are building some of those new industries, and the thing that really makes their innovative and and sometimes risky, depending on the possible, is those kind of collaborative signals. And, and of course, they can also come from policymakers. You can have collective side. I mean, we see we've been doing a lot on green hydrogen. We you know we launched the, the green hydrogen um, catapult um, about eighteen months ago. Um, and then, then just a couple of weeks ago, the, the African Green Hydrogen Coalition, you've got a private sector coalition focused on bringing the cost down. And then you've got a, a, a governmental coalition focused on procurement signals and early stage investment. Um, and I think that we see that also through the amount of investor appetite into tech startups, in, in, in climate tech startups. I think we had about nearly 90 billion um, in the second half of 2020, the first half of this year. That's a t- over a 200% increase so lots of ways in which i think the, the experience of tech sectors going through disruptive s-curve innovation um and and, the, and knowing when we need to collaborate and when we need to um compete is is is, is really starting to affect the whole transition now yeah yeah Nigel, if i think about the audience today you know there's a lot of people who've joined because they're interested in the role that cloud can play whether it's about breaking boundaries between organizations to share data or harnessing the power of machine learning and AI so that we can be much more precise in how decision makers make decision, you know, equipping them with data and insights in more real time. Obviously, there's a big focus on disclosure today, but we're very interested in how we can start to use data for better decision making. You know, do I do I ship this product or do I fly it? Or how do I start to optimize energy efficiency, for example, in, in manufacturing? So I'm keen to know whether whether you see cloud and and how you see cloud playing a role in these transformations? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's evidently huge role. Sometimes just sim- sometimes just simple provision of data. Like I was actually talking to some oil industry execs just about methane leakage. It's a huge problem, right? And just actually um, making sure that data is available real time and, and actionable um, will be will be part of us actually stopping. That, 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 that big part of the problem. But then, uh, you know, you'll, some of the things I hear about, some of the you know, use of AI models to optimize wind turbine blade um, shape and, um, uh, uh, and, and to optimize the deployment of arrays of wind turbines like the one you got behind you there um, in, 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 in this very, very difficult to predict weather environment, right? I mean, we know that weather forecasting is what led to a lot of the breakthroughs in understanding of nonlinear dynamics. Um, and even though we're a lot better now, it still remains a, a, a sort of chronically nonlinear system. I think, I think, you know, from what I hear, quantum computing may help us unlock some, um, particularly some some of the new materials technologies. You know, so, so, you know, data being used and computing power being used to unlock some innovative data technologies. For example, in next generation batteries, you know, we we need a shed load of ba- big big um, safe batteries and, and we know the constraints of lithium that we're going on so i think almost um every area you look at whether it's pure data sets or machine learning and ai being applied to some of these really complex problems that that um and and mostly we think about mitigation at the moment but i think there's also going to be a real need to focus more on on resilience um and maybe maybe areas where we don't tend to think of them as being as sort of tech relevant yeah but you know there are billions of people in the emerging economies who are exposed to climate vulnerabilities and i think some of the sort of drone technologies one great uh, example nigel is is the work we're doing on geospatial analytics to get much more predictive about where and who is who is at risk from climate events like extreme weather or fire risk or sea level changes or flood risk um so yeah i think it's exactly right this isn't just about decarbonization it's also about using intelligence to be smarter about climate risk. I know we've only got a, a few minutes, sadly. So I did want to just ask you about, you know, where things are heading. Obviously, you know, I know you've just got back from Rwanda with Sustainable Energy for All. You're very close to the Egyptian presidency and their focus areas. What can we expect from COP27 in, in Sham? Well, I think a brutal focus on action, implementation, you know, that we've all agreed we need to get to net zero fast and we need to address the resilience needs of about 4 billion people. So there's not there's a lot less to be negotiated in Sharm el-Sheikh. So action, action, action. The Egyptians are really focused on that. Particular focus on emerging and developing countries where most of the lives and livelihoods that are vulnerable to climate change are. And I think a lot of kind of South-South collaboration, I mean, recognising that there's a lot of innovation and a lot of smart people and... and, and uh, 
very motivated people in sub-Saharan Africa and in, in Asia. Um, uh, so I think a real emphasis on innovation for resilience and mobilizing of finance to accelerate the kind of innovative changes we need uh, across the world, but particularly on those areas that have uh, been a little bit uh, under-focused on up to now. Awesome. Thank you, Nigel. And presumably December, you're going to take a bit of a break once you've handed the baton over, but then you're in the job market. Yeah, I mean, I, I will. I mean, basically, I'm in for life in terms of this is existential. I think I can help, um, and um, I think this is the decade where we really need to um, go exponential on every one of the solutions. So I'm not quite sure what I'll be doing, but it will be it'll be in the same domain. Awesome, so, yeah, well, it, 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 interesting ideas. Welcome. Yeah. Lots of roles available in Google, Nigel. But look, uh, let's talk. About, let's talk about that. Yeah, sincere <laughs> congratulations on uh, on the huge Thank momentum you. that you've built, and you know your team. I think it's been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you for sparing the time to talk with us, and look forward to catching up again soon. Great. Thanks a lot, Justin. See you soon. My name is Denise Pearl, and I am the Global Partnerships Lead within Google Cloud for strategic ISVs focused in the areas of geospatial and sustainability. I'm joined today to discuss leveraging spatial finance for climate resilience with Dr. Jamie Herring, CEO of Climate Engine, a Google Cloud partner company focused on using satellite data to build economic resilience to planetary change. In this capacity, he has worked with major corporations and financial institutions around the world. Prior to this, Jamie was the executive digital producer for a variety of climate data products for organizations such as the World Bank, NOAA, NASA, the Gates Foundation, the White House, and the World Resources Institute. Jamie holds a PhD in natural resources and information sciences from Cornell University. We are also joined by Michael Torrance, Chief Sustainability Officer for the Bank of Montreal Financial Group. Michael is passionate about sustainability, especially as it pertains to corporate governance and finance. As Chief Sustainability Officer for BMO, Michael leads strategy and implementation of sustainability governance, disclosure, engagement, and innovation at BMO Financial Group. Michael leads the BMO Climate Institute as well that has been established to analyze climate-related risks and opportunities facing the financial sector and key client industries. Jamie, I'm very excited to hear you and Michael talk about the progress that you're making in this space. Thank you so much, Denise, and thank you all for joining. Today, I want to talk to you about unprecedented climate change. Today, we're facing a world that's changing more rapidly than we've ever witnessed before. That change is having massive impacts across financial institutions, infrastructure, transportation networks, and supply chains globally. To withstand these changes, we need to build financial and operational resilience. Today, we're already witnessing massive impacts of climate change. These impacts have trillions of dollars of impacts on our economy, which are felt by people and ecosystems around the world. One of the biggest myths of our time is that the, ec the economy is disconnected from the environment. And that's something that's borne out time and time again as we make decisions in terms of our development and our, our financing. And the climate crisis, when we talk about it, really can't be resolved until, our, until we act like the economy exists within the planet that we live on. And this is something that we've been working really closely with as a problem with our partners at Google and our partners at BMO to help resolve. The concept we use to understand the changes in the Earth systems and how to connect them to the economy 
is through the concept of spatial finance. When we talk about spatial finance, we're looking at Earth observations and understanding how the planet is changing and trying to connect those changes to the economy. How we do that is through this idea of geospatial science and geospatial computing. Every risk and every planetary change happens somewhere. It's inherently location specific. Every economic activity itself is also inherently location specific. So the, the idea of spatial finance is pulling these two worlds together so that we can, we can bring together the, the world of the environment with the world of the economy and start monitoring how these things intersect and how changes in one could, will affect changes in the other. How we do that is, is we do that through computing. And, and really our, our partnership with Google is, is what allows us to do that. Looking at the planet and looking at the world is a massive computing big data problem. It's one of the biggest big data challenges that we face today. With Google and Google Cloud, what that allows us to do is process all the Earth system data in one location and map that to assets around the world in real time. So we can start monitoring and understanding the impacts of an event like a flood or a wildfire on an asset, on a system, um, while it's happening and sometimes before it happens. And by doing that, we think this can be one of the most important climate adaptation strategies we can have, specifically with finance and with, with economic institutions. Because a lot, of these, a lot of these changes, the Earth system changes, we find out the impacts after they happen. But if we can find out before they happen, that will allow us to move resources around in a way to, to adapt to climate change. One of our partners in this endeavor is BMO, the Bank of Montreal. I'm going to pass it over to Michael to explain how BMO uses, uses spatial finance in their work. Thanks, Jamie. As you've alluded to, there's a real paradigm shift happening in the financial sector in terms of the integration of sustainability, climate considerations, and finance. And this is manifesting in, in a few different ways, both around opportunity and risk management. On the opportunity side, banks like BMO and financial system actors are realizing that there's a lot of ways that capital can be deployed to help solve some of the biggest problems of our time around decarbonization of the economy, management of biodiversity. We can actually create incentives for our clients to take steps to address their own operations and impacts in, in these areas in ways that we, we never did before through instruments like sustainable finance. But in order to have sustainable finance or in order to manage the risks around things like the risks to physical assets from physical climate hazards or to manage the, the risks related to uh, impacts on the environment, you have to have data. You have to know what's happening. You have to know where the physical assets of your clients are. And if you can actually harness data and information to understand the context in which your clients are operating, you could do some incredible things with finance. A few areas where this is particularly uh, clear is around, let's say you wanted to understand GHG emissions uh, related to uh, operations of your clients and build a sustainable finance product that would incentivize decarbonization and track performance over time. We could rely on a company's own reporting or third-party data sources, but it would be incredible if we could actually monitor through real-time satellite information the emissions of different facilities and how those are being better managed and changing over time. When it comes to something like biodiversity, it's all place-based in terms of the impacts on biodiversity. If we could understand where our clients' physical assets, factories, mines, operations exist, we'd be able to marry that up with information about sensitive biodiversity or red listed species, and then be able to ensure that as we're diligencing relationships or uh, creating risk management frameworks, that we understand the potential impacts that our clients are having on uh, the, the environment in which they're operating. And we can work with them to help inform their decision making, and if possible, even again, integrate that into financial instruments. The, the other areas around physical hazards of climate change that you've already touched upon, Jamie, so think about flood risk, wildfire risk. These can have enormous impacts on uh, financial systems, on the economics of a business. And so being better able to understand those risks and even to potentially take proactive steps to mitigate risk is really the potential power of the geospatial modeling approach and leveraging that kind of data and analytics for finance and, and risk management. I think this is a really untapped area of finance and of technology. 
and we're just beginning to unlock the potential of it. But if we could really harness it, I think it's going to be transformational. One of the things that it recognizes is that the next 10, 20, 100 years is not going to look like the last 10, 20, or 100 years in terms of the effects of climate change. So the conventional ways of thinking about these problems in terms of looking at historical data and then basically extrapolating that this is how things will be in the future is actually not a good risk management approach. So we need more real-time forward-looking approaches. And I'm really excited by the opportunities that geospatial big data and modeling allow us to potentially uh, capture. Now, in terms of BMO's own climate strategy, when we launched the BMO Climate Institute last year, our partnership with Climate Engine was one of the, the key catalysts for that uh, development, where we felt that we were able to develop a capability around climate analytics uh, using a platform like this that would really potentially set us apart from the industry. We'd be able to use it to advise our own work internally, as well as to potentially lead thought leadership or to advise our clients externally. And so it really unlocked a lot of potential and capabilities within our bank to, to better position ourselves to capture opportunities and manage risk in this area. So I'll throw it back to you, uh, Jamie, to talk about more about climate risk. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Really, really appreciate that. So how we do this is one of the bigger computing challenges that we face. Uh, to really get at insights and get it, get it actionable insights, what we need to do is pull this massive world of data. There's thousands of satellites being launched every single year uh, to monitor the planet. So what we need to do is, is, is take all that imagery, take all that data, combine it with assets, the whole world of economic data, do that within the cloud. And that's really where the, the work with Google Cloud has been really, really instrumental. This becomes a massive processing challenge. Um, but the idea is using the best available science with all the economic data, we can merge these two worlds together and deliver those as, as actionable insights into financial institutions and other organizations that are trying to build their, their resilience. Climate Engine has been focused on four main areas around physical risk, wildfire, flood, drought, and water availability. We experience climate change mostly through changes to hydrological systems, to changes in water. So what we've done is really focus in and hone in on how these changes to our water cycles are impacting physical assets and impacting the economy. We do that through understanding both historical trends, what's happening today, looking at one to 60 day subseasonal or seasonal forecasts, and then also looking at future timeframes and then delivering all that data via API so we can map those two physical assets to understand what the impacts are and what they're going to be. One example of this that's really important is, is wildfire spread. So what we do is, is we look at where wildfires currently are and start predicting where they're going to be. So that again, we can start moving resources, moving people, whatever that whatever needs to happen in order to build resilience to these specific wildfires. And this again is a massive, massive computing challenge uh, and really is on the frontier of, of both the science and computing. Another area is looking at, at, at flood impacts. We've partnered with Fathom, one of the leading uh, flood modeling companies in the world uh, to help understand where the flood risks are and mapping those to assets are understanding what, what, what the financial impacts of, of, of flooding events will be. Drought is another area of focus. Droughts are happening more frequently, more severely all over the world. And this has massive, massive economic impacts, both to our supply chain, our, our manufacturing, our production, our food security, and, and our economic security. So, so what we do is we focus on, on, on drought, historical drought, what's happening today, and really focus on projecting where the, where the economic impacts of these droughts are gonna be in the next week, one, two weeks, quarter, um, out, to, out to six months. Water availability, finally, is, is, is a one really critical, critical area um, because this is so integral to the economy. We don't have an economy without water. We can't produce things. We can't manufacture anything. We can't produce any food. We can't produce any chips. We can't produce any electronics. So what we do is provide this always-on monitoring of our water systems so that we can attribute where there's going to be water stress and then economic stress um, in, in the global market. And this is really a focus of our incredible science team who have really pulled together decades of research to deliver these data sets always on via API into financial and operation systems around the world. I'm going to pass it back to Denise. 
Jamie, Michael, thank you so much for being here today and offering us some insights into the incredible work that you're doing. Jamie, what I take away from what you just covered is that this is a massive problem, but what I feel like you and, and firms like Bank of Montreal with Michael's support are doing are trying to democratize access to these types of insights and inject them into these operations and financial systems so that consumers or constituents like myself can benefit from all of the insights that you have about planetary change. Uh, so again, thank you so much. We, we are thrilled to have partnerships with Climate Engine and Bank of Montreal and uh, appreciate all of the insights today. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Michael. Hello again. In case you're just tuning in, I'm Kate Brandt, Chief Sustainability Officer at Google. I am so excited by what we just heard. From the incredible Nigel Topping to Jamie and Denise discussing using geospatial data to identify climate risk, and this peek into what companies like Spotify are doing to build for a more sustainable future. All right, we still have a lot of great talks, so don't change the tab. Up next, we have a demo on reducing your IT carbon footprint, and this is followed by a handful of lightning talks. So enjoy the demo and upcoming sessions. Welcome to the Sustainability Summit demo. I'm EGV and I'm here to share how to easily build and work sustainably with tools from our Carbon Sense suite that helps measure, report, and reduce your cloud carbon emissions. Now, about three out of four executives cite technology as critical for their sustainability efforts. The next question then arises, how can organizations measure and minimize carbon pollution from IT operations? which is also known as greenhouse gas emissions. Well, let's explore how to do so on Google Cloud. First, let's begin at the source, AKA the energy that flows through data centers and powers the compute resources organizations use. Electricity was historically sourced by burning fossil fuels, but this has been changing over the last decade thanks to huge investments and accessibility in renewable and non-carbon producing energy like solar, wind, geothermal, etc. Since 2017, Google has matched 100% of its global energy use by purchasing renewable energy and has mitigated the annual carbon footprint of our customers' digital applications and infrastructure. We are also currently working on the ambitious goal of operating 100% of the time on carbon-free energy by 2030. This means we will match our energy demand for every hour of every day in every region where we operate with carbon-free energy supply. For now, it's important for each of us to reduce our cloud carbon emissions by making decisions on the time of day and the regions that power our resources. And so for starters, it's incredibly helpful to understand where your electricity comes from by using online tools like the ones our partner Electricity Map has made available for free. The next thing is to calculate your organization's specific IT carbon emissions. And for this, Google Cloud customers can leverage the out-of-the-box carbon footprint dashboard in the console, which is viewable by folks with billing admin rights. It includes aggregate charts and tables on total emissions by project, by month, by product, by region, et cetera. This same functionality will also be available for workspace customers early next year. With Carbon Footprint, you can also optionally export the data to BigQuery to perform custom analytics and visualizations, and use this data for sustainability reporting requirements on Scope 3 greenhouse gases auditing. 
And as a friendly reminder, there are three emission categories at this time called scope one, two, and three to help enterprises measure their carbon impact. And so scope one and two relate to emissions specifically controlled by an organization. Scope three are an organization's indirect emissions, such as their suppliers' activities or their consumers' product usage or effects from transportation and waste disposal, to just name a few. Now, once empowered with our carbon data, let's take action by diving into some strategies for reducing carbon emissions in your Google Cloud infrastructure. For starters, I'm happy to share that the easiest and most impactful emissions reduction can come from selecting regions powered by cleaner energy in your cloud projects. Google introduced a metric called the Carbon Free Energy Percent, or CFE, to empower users to select regions with higher CFE percentages because they produce fewer carbon emissions. In many of Google Cloud's products, when choosing a region, there's also a friendly low CO2 icon in the Cloud console. This icon is also annotated in the Locations page of the documentation for different products. Now, if you are looking for proactive advice on what regions to use, there's also the fantastic Region Picker tool that helps you compare priorities around lowering emissions versus pricing versus latency. For example, you can learn that by moving a workload from London to Finland, you can increase the carbon-free energy percent by 23% and lower the price by 14%. I really recommend you check it out when you have a chance. And if your organization provides users with the choice to select cloud regions, you can furthermore set organizational policies to restrict locations to low carbon intensive regions using low carbon mode. Or you can allow or deny specific regions in the policy value box when configuring the resource location restriction. You do this by entering the in prefix and then a specific string for one or multiple low carbon locations. The next recommendation is to avoid resources from running 24 hours a day, especially for development and testing. And so for example, by shifting resources to operate 10 hours a day during five workdays a week. Instead, you can reduce your footprint by 70%, which is an impactful and cost-saving move. And on the same topic around scheduling, programming workloads to run during the day when there's clean energy available like solar or wind is also very powerful. For example, checking the energy mix in the UK on electricity map at 7 p.m shows it's 284 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour of electricity. However, executing that same workload earlier in the day, such as 1 p.m., can be 200. And so by shifting workloads that may have operated at night to run earlier, like at 1 p.m., can reduce carbon emissions by up to 29%. And of course, in addition to intentionally shortening resource schedules, you can also proactively delete unused VMs, optimize VM shapes, as well as shut down inactive projects. This is where the Active Assist tool really shines, as it proactively suggests carbon-reducing configurations, along with other cost performance and security-friendly actions. This is thanks to machine learning. There's also several low-carbon architecture designs you can improve. Here's just a couple. For example, by using managed serverless products, you can leverage their separation in storage and compute resources, enabling to use the same storage space while auto-scaling VMs up or down based on traffic. This also prevents incurring compute or storage costs from idle resources. And by also refactoring monolithic applications into bite-sized microservices, you can gain many efficiency benefits. This is because microservices operate as self-contained modular functions that have less dependencies. They are easier to maintain and debug and offer more granular control over resource scaling and less tests. And so in summary, wherever you are on your sustainability journey, you have tools you can use in Google Cloud, such as Carbon Footprint, Region Picker, or Active Assist that are out of the box which I have linked in this video's description along with other helpful strategies.
And friends, if there's one main thing to remember, the best way to reduce your day-to-day -day carbon footprint is by picking the lowest carbon intensive regions. For more information and best practices, please check out cloud.google.com forward slash carbon footprint. And now be sure to stick around for the sessions that happen right after this demo that'll cover beautiful topics such as climate insights, sustainable food systems, and conservation efforts. Enjoy the rest of your time at the summit and thank you for being here. Cheers. Hello everyone, I'm Ed Sniffin, uh, the Deputy Director for Hawaii Department of Transportation. Here to talk to you today about how to manage the impact of climate change on infrastructure. Now, I gotta say, I'm not from every state, so I don't know everyone's requirements in their different areas. So I'm gonna talk to you about what Hawaii did to make sure we manage the, the impact of climate change in our area. Uh, for, uh, for us, we, we needed several things. We need to know first where we're gonna go, um, understanding the, the climate science that we have, understanding the impacts we have in our islands, understanding our needs, uh, we started there. Second, we made sure that we communicated our needs with our policymakers, with our public, to ensure everybody could come with us. And third, we started making sure we move forward. The last thing we wanted to do is get, get stuck um, in, in this analysis of paralysis. We wanted to make sure we started taking that first step because it's always easier to move after that. Of course, we can't do it ourselves. So we worked with all of our counties, our four counties out there. We wanted to make sure that all levels of government were aligned in the way we were going to move. We definitely worked with the federal government who's come in with this um, IIJA that allows more funding specifically for resilience in our system. And definitely worked with AASHTO, our Association of uh, State Highway Transportation Officials that's represented by 50 states and two territories. So all of us in all of the states can share our, our best practices and move forward together. For us at, um, in AASHTO, we made sure that we adjusted the way we looked at resilience. In the past, resilience for Hawaii meant responding to and recovering from events. That's it. We were extremely reactive. Now we're actually, we're actually a lot more proactive, making sure we plan for and, and ensure that we can absorb a lot of the impacts that come through so we don't put our public through in, uh, to the negative impacts from these emergencies. But we also make sure we take the lessons that we learn from those emergencies and pull them back into the planning, design, construction, and maintenance cycle that we always run through as states, bring, making every project that, that we do more and more resilient. <clears throat> now for us, again, we had to start off and, and understand where we were. We looked at the eight major impacts on our islands uh, to see how they impact our, our infrastructure on our system. Uh, our landslides and wildfires, definitely things that are occurring more often. Storm surges and flooding. It looks, it looks like flooding, it looks the same, but all for different reasons. So different tactics are necessary for both of them. We looked at coastal erosion that's occurring tremendously on the northern side of all of our islands and partially because we started putting up hardening in different areas. Our lava flows, we couldn't do anything about how, how those occur, but we definitely, definitely can make sure we're ready for them as they come through. Rockfall hazards occurring more often in different areas because of the, the weathering on our system and because most of our roads are running along steep slopes that used to be rock. And definitely our surf, um, looking at how they impact not only the erosion of the system, but how they impact the, the operations when that water keeps washing through in different areas. We took those impacts and did a vulnerability study to ensure we understand how it impacts our whole system. And we did our climate adaptation, adaptation action plan. Now our action plan pulls all of those vulnerabilities together and makes sure we have a stepping process on what we can do to be better. The first portions are always inward looking. There's policies and procedures we needed to unpack to make sure we can move forward in the right way. Going from uh, reactive to proactive was tremendous in the way we, we started looking at everything. And of course, when we start looking at our climate adaptation, we got to look at our preservation of our system. We're all required to keep our system in good, uh, a high level of maintenance. And those projects that we push forward on those have to be tied back into resilience. Resilience has got to be like safety. I mean, we shouldn't have resilience projects anymore. Every project has to have a resilient component. So we tied these two systems together. 
to make sure that everybody could see what we're looking at, we made sure we put a viewer out there to the public so everybody could see the impacts that we're looking at, how our projects would address those impacts from a preservation perspective and a resilience perspective moving forward. And it was excellent. We got the public and our policymakers involved to ensure that they understood what we're looking at. But this model was a little bit limited and you can see it. I mean, when we started looking at these areas, we looked at our exposure assessments. So we looked at our, uh, where we were risk, where we had um, areas of risk and we addressed those immediately. We wanted to do, make sure that all of the areas that could fail were shored up and protected immediately. So we could give that, give us that five to 10 years of time frame that we could start moving forward on the mid range and long range approaches. So we got out there, we mitigated the risks, we made sure that we could monitor everything. So we set up systems that allows us to watch those areas, to ensure that we can take actions when necessary. But again, pretty limited. It was just two components of so many options that we got to consider, or so many issues that we got to consider that affect our state. So we wanted to look for a better model, a better way to measure these and show everybody what we're measuring, to, a better way to make decisions throughout the process. And the only way we can do that is make sure we pull a lot more information um, into the system, information that's relevant to what's important to the state, equity, um, our economy, our access to opportunities and goods and services, our ecology, our environment, all of those have to be considered. So we worked with Google to, pre to prepare this tool that allows us to layer out all of these different issues into this one um, integrated and visual mapping. Um, each of the four different tabs that you see up there have four or five different tabs under it as well. So we're laying about, layering about 18 to 20 layers of decision-making in all of this. And what comes out of it is an easy visual way for everybody to see where the risks are. You can see on this map, green, yellow, red, high risk to low risk. That's what we wanted. We wanted to make sure everybody could look at this and see where we should be putting our resources. We could dig even further to make sure that we could show them not only where we put our resources, but how big those resources are, are and that's necessary to address the issues in the system. This tool has been tremendous in allowing us to update our legislators, our policymakers, our governors, our mayors, to ensure that everybody understands where we need to be, and where we need to be investing to address all of these issues, not just climate change, not just sea level rise, but equity, economy, all of those things that are important to the state are all measured in here. So we can see how our projects that were planned uh, will, will, will impact our system in all of these different areas. It's a extremely powerful tool for us to move forward um, in our decision making and um, buy-in from our legislators. <clears throat> so big, big thing, the key takeaways for everybody from all of our opportunities that we saw going forward is to start now. Um, you know, in the past, people were stuck on the climate science. Is it right? Uh, whose is the best? Uh, what, what level of, of sea level rise are we planning for? Decide on it and take an action already. Um, understand that your documents and your plans are, are all living documents as you go forward. So for us on, uh, in Hawaii, we took our, our, the best climate science that we saw and we decided on a, on a one meter rise and we're moving. If we see later on that we need to adjust, we'll do it. We wanted to make sure that we got tools that allowed us to communicate all of the needs and the priorities that we're uh, putting everything in to everybody that's out there. And then we want to make sure that we took action, short, midterm, and long-term action, so that everybody could see um, that there's no, I mean, there's there's no, no no stopping, there's no delaying, we just gotta go. So we took the steps <clears throat> in different areas, we took them in different in different ways. On the left, you see on the leeward coast, uh, we have bridges in that area that have to be replaced, but they're gonna be inundated in the future. So we replace them with structures that we can remove in 30 years. Um, it makes it cheaper for us to put in now, it makes sure that we don't waste any resources um, and it makes sure that if we're wrong and it's not inundated, we could just take that bridges out and drop another one in. It makes it very flexible for us moving forward. Second slide you see on the North shore of, of Oahu, it's uh, that area is getting eroded tremendously. Now uh, we could spend 30 million bucks for a retaining wall, but we decided we're gonna go with the soft revetment to ensure that we can put money into to something that protects the roads for the next five to 10 years and allows us to plan out what we're gonna do in that area. The planning is going to include land use. Uh, we got to determine whether or not people are actually going to be living there in the future. And if not, determine whether we need the road or not. Third slide is another bridge that we used in aqua option to make sure we could shore up an area that, that was absolutely um, eroded out uh, by storm surge throughout the area. Um, that bridge was, was um, undercut and we made sure that we have a structure now that supports it without any of the supports that are in place. And the last one is our is a difference in approach in what we did before. Instead of putting in a retaining wall to protect the road, 
for uh, reestablishing the beach using a passive system. The sand saver model is going to bring in more sand to build up the beach to protect our road. And then later on, we're going to look at how we can use we can upgrade the reefs to protect this beach. <clears throat> in this area of Honolulu Highway, it gets flooded um, regularly by just normal storm surge. So we're relocating this bridge because we know we have, I mean, sorry, this roadway because we know we have the room to do so. And we got $90 million from our federal government to do so as well. <clears throat> and of course, those are just us trying to address the climate change issues. But now we've got to make sure that we're not part of the problem. So we've cut our energy consumption tremendously. And we're looking at going to a net zero uh, by, by changing out all of our systems, our LED systems, making sure that we have uh, PV on all of our, our structures on our system as well. Uh, we're using better materials, uh, carbon and chain concrete, to, to make sure we can get rid of some of the waste in the in the air and strengthen our concrete with it. Um, we're building out plastic pavements now to make sure we put more waste into improving our pavements out there. And of course, we're converting all of our like duty and mid-duty vehicles uh, to EVs, pushing all of that, that CO2 emissions from the transportation system back into the energy sector so we can start supporting that conversion to hydrogen on energy. So all of these pieces kind of marry together to ensure that we become part of the solution versus part of the problem. Thank you very much for your time. Travis McVale, Engineering Lead for Core Services of the Google Maps platform. I'm excited to talk with you today about achieving carbon neutrality with cloud native analysis. Joining me is Jaime Sanchez, Head of Cloud Solutions at Cardo, a premier GCP partner. Jaime, can you walk us through a little bit of what Cardo is doing in this space? Thank you, Travis. Today we'll be talking about a project we did uh, with uh, cities in, in Europe uh, called AI for Cities. And the challenge and the goals here are basically to design an AI solution that is able to ultimately reduce CO2 emissions and help the cities meet their climate commitments. The cities involved are here on the screen, Helsinki, Amsterdam, Tallinn, Paris, Copenhagen, and Stravanger. One of the ways that we were targeting you know, these emissions uh, is by activating certain micromobility spots, meaning where do we actually put uh, scooters, bicycles, in order to reduce emissions by you know, taking a look at the, at the wider network of transportation in a city. That's a really good overview, Jaime. So could you tell us a little bit about who are the target users for this solution? Yeah, so this solution is meant to, um, to combine a lot of different uh, data sets and make it really easy for a city planner uh, to be able to, uh, to put these spots to reduce CO2 emissions. And by spots, I mean where to actually um, place the chargers and the stations for bicycles and scooters. That's really insightful, Hamid. So what's a real life scenario here? Yeah, let me actually put my city planner cap on. And, and in this view, we're looking at the city of Tallinn and I'm actually opening up a uh, analysis for optimizing the stations. So here you're seeing uh, in a green a grid or heat map, all the CO2 emissions and those dark spots is where we wanna actually you know, relieve the CO2. And so we have the ability to, to optimize um, where we place a new infrastructure. Uh, in, in red uh, and in yellow, you're seeing the existing infrastructure. But what we're trying to do is, is understanding where to put the new ones. In a way, doing a site selection exercise here. And, and what I'm doing as a city planner is I'm able to actually mm, uh, optimize by the variables that I want. So I'm choosing population, a set of POIs, and then running with a number of, uh, of, of stations. 
and the result is basically a, a, a map that gives me the, you know, the spots exactly where I, I, I could place uh, these uh, micromobility uh, hotspots, as we can call them. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds like the goal of the solution is to really reduce congestion and emissions for cities, right? Correct, correct. And, and uh, yeah, Travis, basically what we want to do here is, is reduce emissions and get, get down to the, the committed levels uh, of, for that city. Oh, this is really awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about how Google is really helping to fuel and enhance this analysis? Yeah, so we use Google every step of the way from data to analytics to the actual solution. So um, we use Earth Engine to get emissions and temperature data. We use then GeoBeam to, to pipe that data, which is raster into vector, uh, so that we can analyze it in BigQuery GIS. And then uh, finally, the solution uses a Google Maps platform for really beautiful vector-based uh, base maps for all the APIs from geocoding to routing. And, uh, and here you have it. It's an it's a end-to-end geospatial solution on top of, on top of BigQuery and, and Google. This has been fantastic, Jaime. Really appreciate all the work that you and Cardo are really driving in this space. Thank you, Travis, for hosting us. And uh, it's been great to be here in the Sustainability Summit. Thank you all. Elliot Grant, and I lead a project at Alphabet's X Division, focused on solving the challenge of sustainability in agriculture. Why should Alphabet care about agriculture, and why does it need solving? Modern agriculture is responsible for a huge share of the climate crisis and consumes most of the usable land and most of the fresh water on Earth. And yet humanity needs to squeeze 70% more production out of it in the next 30 years. The fact is, if productivity doesn't increase dramatically and sustainably, i.e. using fewer resources, then feeding the population by 2050 will entail clear-cutting most of the world's remaining forests, obliterating thousands more species, and releasing enough greenhouse gases to single-handedly exceed the two-degree warming target. Well, that certainly qualifies as an alphabet-sized problem, but why isn't it already solved? Previous gains in productivity came through simplification, but farming sustainably at global scale is not simple. It's complex. To solve the challenge of scaling complex, sustainable farming, the project I lead, called Mineral, is taking a radically different approach, unlocked by recent advances in machine learning to pursue breakthroughs in plant perception and global scale data and compute. Now, this isn't the first time that food production has been transformed by technology. Deere invented mechanization. Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch discovered the ability to make nitrogen fertilizers from air and became BASF. Monsanto leveraged biotechnology to manipulate plant DNA. Each of these radically changed how farming was done. And now we stand at the cusp of the next revolution, a revolution in computing power and ML capabilities that will create a step change in how we understand the plant world. Understanding the world's agricultural data is an audacious idea. There's at least 4 billion acres of it, but it's well suited to Alphabet's capabilities. It's a staggeringly vast data set and it grows every day. And yet we've begun to create new knowledge from it using deep learning. We can now predict yields. We can predict what farmers will grow next season and can identify the optimal land to grow certain crops. But we're not stopping at organizing remotely sensed data and public data. At X, we try to be audacious. As Street View is to Google Maps, 
we wanted to understand the plant world at unprecedented resolution. We wanted to go to the individual plant level. And we noticed that it was very difficult to collect high quality data about plants. Farmers and crop breeders and researchers and advisors today rely on walking through fields and visually inspecting them. So we invented robots that could perceive and understand the plant world for them in a whole new way. Let me leave you with a very specific application of this technology. The world's crop genetic diversity is preserved in gene banks around the world. Millions of seeds and their genetic secrets are frozen in these vaults. What if our robots could help unlock those secrets faster? La agricultura para mí significa muchas cosas buenas. Mis padres campesinos, mis abuelos, todos en mi generación fueron campesinos. Ya ha cambiado mucho. El agua siempre era abundante y ahora ha mermado mucho. Necesitamos cambiar la forma pues, de nuestros cultivos. Agriculture is a big contributor to climate change. It's also a major victim of climate change. It consumes 70% of the world's fresh water. It's responsible for about a quarter of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Farmers in the global south, for example, are seeing more extreme weather conditions, droughts, floods, unpredictable weather events that are making it really hard for them to grow. Unless we fix agriculture, we won't solve climate change and we won't be able to feed everyone on the planet. Our mission at X is to invent radical new solutions to some of the world's hardest problems. Mineral is X's project in sustainable agriculture. The genesis of Project Mineral was the insight that to manage the complexity of growing food sustainably, we'd need completely new ways of understanding the plant world. Mineral's philosophy is how do we partner with other experts, other companies in the agricultural system to together solve some of these intractable problems. What's at stake is human survival to a certain extent. We have one billion people hungry, we have a planetary crisis, and we see food at the center of that. CGIR's mission is about transforming food, land, and water systems in a climate crisis. But in simple words, feeding the planet in a sustainable way. One of the key things that CGIR does is improve varieties of crops. Here in this facility, what we work on is beans. We're working to improve bean varieties so that farmers have the means to produce beans in a changing climate, increase their nutritional status, increase their income, give them the seed and the ability to improve their livelihoods. We have 36,000 different types of bean collected. Every single one has a story to tell and could be the solution to so many of our planetary challenges out there. Many of these beans have been collected over the last hundred years from around the world. And what's really fascinating is most of these beans have never been characterized. The researchers don't know how these beans grow, what they look like, what environments they would thrive in. So we've partnered with them to use our technology to understand those beans' capabilities for the first time. It took us 30 years to produce a drought-tolerant bean where we found the trait for drought tolerance in one of these beans in the collection. With the technology of mineral, we can move into absolute precision in finding these types of traits, much quicker, much cheaper, and much more efficiently. A crop breeder today, or a plant researcher today, will go into the field during the growing season and observe every plant in that field. They'll use their senses, they'll use a yardstick, they'll use a notepad. 
and they're trying to measure as much detail as they can for those plants. Imagine trying to do that in a field with a million plants in it. The Mineral Rover is the combination of a number of cutting-edge technologies. We've taken the best of robotics and optics and machine learning and high-performance computing and put them all together in this first-of-its-kind machine that can go through a field and image every single plant with unprecedented detail. The rover is counting pods, counting leaves, counting individual beans in ways that we could never have done before. It's doing it faster, it's doing it more frequently, and we can get new traits and new characteristics that we weren't able to get with human labor. The opportunity that we have in front of us is to combine the capabilities of the mineral rover with the expertise of plant breeders to accelerate the discovery of crops that will transform the lives of millions of farmers and the people who rely on them around the world. More than 90% of beans that are consumed globally will at one stage have passed through this facility. A bean sounds very trivial, but it could be the solution to so many things. We could be looking at reducing deforestation. We could be looking at adapting to the climate crisis. We could be improving child development in the first thousand days through better nutrition. So much more than just a bean. Farmers have tremendous intuition about what's right for them on their farm. We see our job is to invent new technologies that can help them better understand the plant world. And that way they can create innovations that solve the problem of sustainable agriculture. Minerals developing new technologies to help build a more sustainable, a more resilient, and a more productive food system. And ultimately, meet the world's growing demand for food. We love hearing from developers in agriculture. Please drop us a line at mineral at x.team. Thanks very much. Here at Google, we've been obsessed with mapping the ever-changing world for over 15 years. During that time, we've helped businesses and organizations visualize real-world impact, allowing them to make faster decisions, which drive sustainable goals and actions globally. Google Maps platform tailors and extends our consumer product for businesses and organizations to deliver the most accurate, real-time model of the world, a familiar map loved by billions, and adding to that enterprise-grade solutions, security, and support. Today, I'd like to introduce Michelle DeLeon, Director of Impact and Strategic Partnerships at SkyTruth, one of our customers and a conservation technology nonprofit. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Mike. SkyTruth is a conservation technology nonprofit founded in 2001 that provides free fact-based information to expose environmental wrongdoing around the world. Using satellite imagery and advanced data analysis techniques, we reveal environmentally significant actions, making either largely invisible impacts visible, measurable, and actionable. Over the past two decades, our team of experts have worked closely with advocates, researchers, journalists, and government agencies to develop new tools and approaches to address the planet's bigger conservation challenges. For example, we built Global Fishing Watch in partnership with Google and Oceana to provide the world's first global view of, ocean, of commercial fishing activities. And in 2010, our team of analysts was the first to show that the scope from the Deepwater Horizon disaster was vastly larger than the BP and Coast Guard had claimed. With increasing availability of satellite imagery, coupled with innovations in remote sensing, cloud computing, data science, and artificial intelligence, SkyTruth now has the opportunity to exponentially expand our work to detect not just one oil spill, but to create a global map of ocean oil pollution 
and hold polluters accountable. Our new project called Cerulean detects oil spills around the world's oceans in real time. At the heart of Cerulean is a machine learning model that comes through thousands of radar satellite images from the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1 mission and detects the telltale signs of oil slicks. For the first phase of Cerulean, Skytruth has trained a model to focus on oil slicks created by vessels, particularly large cargo ships and petrochemical tankers, often due to the intentional discharge of untreated, oily wastewater into the ocean, an illegal practice known as bilge dumping. The machine learning model operates in the cloud to analyze satellite imagery and integrates the detected oil slicks with global vessel tracking information called Automatic Identification System, or AIS. This then allows us to identify the probable vessel source of oil slick. Here's what a typical bilge discharge looks like using cerulean. On radar imagery, land appears bright, water generally appears dark, and oil slicks on the water are generally black. Oil slicks form a dark streak on the ocean surface that appears strikingly artificial. In this case, we're looking at an 80 mile long oil slick that is wrapping around the coast of Indonesia at one point within just a few miles of Indonesia's first national park. The vessel potentially responsible for this pollution is visible as a very bright spot on, at the north end of the slick. The Cerulean model has been operating since August 2020. In the first 12 months, we processed more than 480,000 Sentinel-1 images and attacked more than 1,000 slicks from vessels, confirmed by our experienced human analysts. In many cases, we're able to identify the likely source vessels. Cerulean allows us to identify potential hotspots of chronic oil pollution in the world's oceans. From our initial analysis, these oil pollution incidents are concentrated in a small number of countries. And while public scrutiny has largely focused on major oil spill incidents, like the Deepwater Horizon disaster, Cerulean has revealed a startling portrait of the extent of chronic oil pollution from vessels, with more than a thousand slicks detected by Cerulean so far. This suggests that this chronic problem is a significant source of oil pollution in our oceans. Through SkyTrip Alerts, our free mapping interface powered by Google Maps Platform API, we're able to share our analyst reviewed cerulean data at no cost. Using SkyTrip Alerts, anyone can zoom into specific incidents detected by cerulean, gather information on probable vessel sources, overlay other data sources, and even get alerts of incidents in areas of concern. Through this mapping platform, Researchers, advocates, and journalists can further investigate patterns around oil pollution. Journalists are already using cerulean data to investigate the sources and frequency of pollution incidents, and the effectiveness of government programs that should be mitigating those incidents. For example, cerulean data prompted journalists from Lighthouse Reports to dig deeper on the extent of chronic oil pollution in European Union waters due to the lack of transparency from government agencies. In March 2022, these outlets released a groundbreaking series of stories documenting routine dumping of oily bilge waste at sea and sharing estimates of the extent of this problem based in part on cerulean data. As we collect more and more examples of oil slicks, the cerulean model will get smarter, identifying oil pollution from other sources and giving the world a fuller picture of the impact of oil on our ocean. We are currently training the cerulean model to detect oil slicks from stationary infrastructure, particularly offshore oil and gas platforms and subsea pipelines. We'll soon be able to add those detections on the site of the mapping interface. Ocean industrial activities are expected to increase in the coming years, specifically the shipping and offshore oil and gas industries, the two most economically and ecologically significant ocean industries outside of fishing. The lack of all the acceptable global surveillance and the growth of ocean industrial activities may lead to increased impacts to marine ecosystems, coastal communities, and the climate, particularly from the destructive, immediate, and long term impacts of marine oil pollution. Through a publicly available tool like Cerulean, we hope to further democratize innovations in like machine learning and cloud computing to support ocean conservation and amplify action on the climate crisis. 
thank you so much for sharing the impact that you and SkyTruth have made, Michelle, and the creativity you've shown bringing together the best of Google tools to make a difference in the world. It's so exciting to see how technology is making it possible for you to support businesses and governments in their sustainability journey. I think you've inspired all of us today. And thank you to everyone who's taken the time to join us today. Thanks very much. Welcome everyone, I am Sophia Reich and I'm a Geo Sustainability Solutions Lead at Google and I'm very excited to be here today hosting this lightning talk with NGIS and Rainforest Trust. So with me today we have Dr. Erin McCrellis, she's a Conservation Science and Monitoring Specialist at Rainforest Trust and we have also Nathan Eden who is the Executive Director at NGIS. So Erin, um, why don't you tell us more about Rainforest Trust mission and the need to use data to monitor forests? Sure, thank you, Sophia, for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Rainforest Trust is a US-based environmental nonprofit and our mission is to save endangered wildlife and protect our planet by creating rainforest reserves through partnerships, community engagement, and donor support. We've had a successful long-term partnership with Google, which has provided nearly $750,000 to Rainforest Trust since 2015. Since our founding in 1988, Rainforest Trust has helped protect more than 39 million acres. We currently have another 33 million acres in the pipeline, and we're aiming for at least 125 million by 2025. These protections have conserved the habitat of more than 3,000 threatened species and permanently locked up 9.5 billion metric tons of CO2. This map of our portfolio shows our geographic scope. We've partnered with organizations in 62 countries across the tropical Americas, Africa, and Asia. The green are areas that are fully protected, orange are projects we're currently working on, and yellow are the most urgent projects we're fundraising for at the moment. Threats facing the areas where we work include deforestation, mining, habitat degradation, fires, poaching, and climate change. To ensure we're creating lasting protections, we need to be able to monitor these threats through time across 1,600 individual parcels that make up 360 protected areas that we've supported. Many of these threats can be detected and tracked using remote sensing and satellite imagery, but we've lacked the technical capacity to monitor our entire portfolio on a real-time basis which is critical for responding to threats in real time. Back to you, Sophia. Thank you so much, Erin. So Nathan, will you tell us more about how NGIS is helping with Rainforest Trust mission? Yeah, thanks, Sophia. Um, at NGIS, we really think we've got the best job in the world. So we get to work with amazing organizations such as Rainforest Trust, and we get to partner with Google to actually take the, the amazing Google technology and actually work to put the pieces of the puzzle together to really build solutions for impact. And this, these solutions for impact are impact for some of the biggest global challenges that we're facing, including sustainable development, disaster risk reduction, biodiversity, climate change, and the conservation of our forests, as Aaron was talking about previously. And more recently, we've been focusing our impact on the sustainable sourcing of raw materials, where we have built a product called Tracemark to really deliver transparency and traceability in global supply chains. So what we're trying to achieve here is a first mile data-driven approach to sustainable sourcing. And we can only really do this with Google technology. There's no way we could do it with anything else. So what we're looking to achieve with Tracemark is to, to map supply chains and enable organizations to really monitor at a global scale, but zoom in on their supply chain to view things such as commodity extent surrounding their supply chain, high value carbon stocks, high biodiversity areas, and detection of deforestation. But we're not only looking to, to view these layers, but we're really trying to, to analyze key sustainability metrics against the specific volumes of raw materials being sourced by organizations. And so by doing this, we're also looking to provide integration patterns to actually surface these sustainability metrics 
in purchasing systems, in contract negotiations, to the areas where, where they're needed most. So to really make sustainability a fundamental component of key business systems for organizations. And through this, we're, we're really delivering a top-down approach for analyzing ESG performance across entire supply chains, but being able to drill down into respective suppliers to actually enable organizations to see how suppliers compare to, to others, to provide that benchmark capability, but really to provide the tools to actually allow organizations to address sustainability and to actually shift the needle in terms of what they can do as a business to improve their overall ESG performance. And we're looking to deliver this capability and tailor it for organizations to, to enable impact, and such as delivering a deforestation and fire alerts into the inbox of Erin and her, her fantastic team at Rainforest Trust. And as Erin mentioned before, they currently have over 39 million acres of protected areas that they needed to monitor. And that's looking to increase to 125 million acres by 2025. So huge amounts of, of area that they need to monitor. And so trying to take that earth observation remote sensing capability, but package it in a way that, that really works for Erin and her team so they can actually focus on, on their work with protecting these, these high conservation areas. And really at the heart of Tracemark is the approach of using Google Geo and geospatial technology to, to layer and combine massive amounts of data. So looking at combining customer data, so yeah, particular supply chain data, volumes, footprints, combining that with enormous archives of data from Google, but then also providing the ability to integrate third-party data, whether that's high-resolution satellite imagery from Planet um, or other data in terms of social scores. Really, we're trying to provide that geospatial and data-driven approach to bring all of this data together and attach it to supply chain of organizations. And this includes amazing data from Google Earth Engine, delivering unprecedented level of environment and sustainability data to organizations, which is really at the heart of Tracemark. But by putting all this together, the objective is to enable the delivery of these data and metrics that organizations need to track their progress towards meeting their specific and very tangible corporate commitments to sustainability. Thanks, Sophia. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you, Erin. It is really incredible to see all the great work that you've been doing in this space. In fact, we see that geospatial data from platforms such as Google Earth Engine, which Tracemark relies on, combined with analytics, really enables businesses to do so much more and helps them drive their sustainability goals. And that is really transformational. So thank you so much for being here with me today. I, it was a pleasure to, to talk with you. again. It's incredible to see how technology can accelerate how we assess and improve sustainability through data, AI, maps, and so much more. While there is still a lot of work to be done, I feel inspired listening to all of these groups, companies, nonprofits, and partners who are really pushing the boundaries of what is possible to accelerate sustainability across business. Okay, next up we have another great demo happening here in the studio. It's going to show us how to use geospatial data to visualize environmental risk. And then we're going to wrap up the event with a few more lightning talks, including a final session about green versus greenwashing with Andrew Friedman of Axios. And then I'll join you back here at the end. So with that, please enjoy the demo and the remaining sessions. Howdy everyone and welcome to the Sustainability Summit demo. I'm AGV. And I'm David. Today we're here to share with you a brief overview of how organizations can approach climate risk analysis using data analytics and AI. This is important, especially because as climate change progresses, the infrastructure and supply chains of businesses that were built to withstand prior historical conditions are today becoming vulnerable to the increasingly frequent and heavy precipitation events. 
Also, extreme temperatures, rising sea levels, and intense climate hazards. And so resilience planning and strategic investment helps organizations ensure that their systems continue to deliver reliable performance in the face of changing climate. So in the next few minutes, let's learn how we could approach this data problem, where we need to combine multiple streams of private, public, and third-party data to derive predictive insights. In order to dive in, let's focus on a specific use case, such as analyzing wildfire risk for an electricity transmissions operator. Do note that any business can use the same process similarly for other types of climate hazards. Great, and so from this, Let's first start by defining the time frame for our planning period. Long-term multi-year analysis is important for maintenance forecasting and replacing existing infrastructure, but a lot can change. It's also incredibly helpful from a crisis response perspective to analyze, for example, the spread of wildfire in the next 24 hours. For climate risk analysis, the sweet spot is looking at the upcoming weeks and months to both encompass emergency planning and mitigation per season. So this will be our goal. With that in mind, the ideal output is a map that shows areas of high risk of wildfire that could impact electrical operations and nearby communities, and also offer preventative recommendations such as removing brush from this area and from that area. Roger that. So then let's assess then what kind of information we're gonna need like a recipe almost, will need the following data ingredients. A data set that is labeled with areas of risky plant vegetation that can fuel a fire. This is key in order to predict the probability of a fire. We will also need several data sets for different land and weather conditions, such as elevation and wind patterns, since these factors can help predict fire direction on slopes, humidity, soil moisture, precipitation, and the minimum and maximum temperatures by week or by month, for example. Awesome. With that in mind, let's now dive into the process. Here's the architectural diagram. For starters, we will need labeled data, which we can find either online or have teams or partner organizations manually labeling data if it's very niche. Labeled data means having tags for a wide variety of examples. We ideally want a balanced data set containing around the same number of examples for each kind of tag. As an example, we go to our local firefighter's office and ask them about wildfire risk in the area. They hand us a printed map with high and low risk areas on different seasons. We then go back to our computers and use mapping software like Google Maps or Earth Engine, for example, to create polygons in a map from the highlighted regions. Next, we select a thousand or more random points that are of high risk and another 1000 low risk points to avoid bias when we feed these examples to an ML model in a bit. Next, we want the elevation and weather data along with our fire risk labels. So using Dataflow, which is a scalable data processing tool, we fetch data from Earth Engine's public datasets that can come from different satellite bands. And next, because we want the model to analyze images rather than individual points, we also fetch the surrounding pixels of each point to create examples of high and low risk pixel patches for our model using the Earth Engine's function ee.image.getdownload URL to request the data. Now, two cool things to call out here for you. One is that Earth Engine normalizes all these different geospatial data sources to enable us to work with the same format. And the second thing is that Dataflow helps us auto scale all these data requests that we are making to Earth Engine. So they all happen in parallel, reducing the time from hours to minutes, which is beautiful. Awesome. Also note that if we want weekly predictions, we need the data from the prior weeks. And similarly, we need the prior month's data for monthly predictions. Now we have examples of high and low risk areas, including the weather and satellite data. We're almost ready to train a model. Next, Dataflow splits the training examples into two datasets, one with the majority of the examples for the model to learn and adjust, 
and the other for the model to validate on data it has never seen before. And as a friendly note, one of our favorite frameworks in our developer YouTube series called People and Planet AI is that we use convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, as our go-to when working with satellite data. Because they work just like our eyes, they analyze images and find patterns for us. CNNs are great for training a model based on images because it infers context from the arrangement of pixels without having you to explicitly tell it. Exactly. And so next, we use TensorFlow Keras, which is a powerful ML library, to define our model and create our training script, which we use to train the model in Vertex AI, which is an AI-managed platform. Note that in Vertex AI, we will choose TPU or GPU processing chips for this AI workload because it significantly shortens the training time over regular VMs. Exactly. And next, we play with the model until we're happy with the results. For example, we can have the model predict the fire risk of the same map we got from the firefighter experts and compare how well it did. Once we're happy with the model, we host it in Cloud Run as an online prediction service. Cloud Run is an easy to use managed web platform. It only uses resources per request instead of having machines running 24 hours a day. And it's also available in low carbon footprint regions. Now to visualize the predictions in a useful and actionable way, this is the creative part and where the magic begins. I agree. And we can initially prototype this in a Colab notebook or create a wildfire map layer in Earth Engine's editor called a mask. But eventually, we can build this out in a formal map-like web app that labels pixels from 0 to 1, 0 being of no risk, to one being high risk, and colors them appropriately to pop out. We could even filter for high risk areas that are surrounding electrical infrastructure. We can also show scorecards with summaries of the risk analysis. We can even filter by date or show a month by month visual based on average historical weather to see, for example, what does July compare to versus January? And from a reporting summary, we could also have these visuals stored as images into cloud storage and automatically exported into a Google Slides presentation. And there you have it. A quick walkthrough on one way to do wildfire risk analysis. Other hazards can be done in a similar way. We just need the right data. So what's next? If you want to learn more, we have a notebook with all the code you need. It goes step by step on how to create an AI model that generates land cover maps. They help to keep track of changes on the earth like deforestation or urban growth. You can also follow us more in our People and Planet AI series, which I have linked below with other helpful resources. We hope you enjoyed the demo. Be sure to stick around for the next sessions. They'll cover sustainable solutions for fleet management, eliminating electricity emissions, and corporate climate action. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day at the summit. Thank you for being here. Cheers. Bye. What excites me about global air traffic is that we're connecting the world. Swiss is part of the Lufthansa Group and the national airline of Switzerland, operating one of the youngest and most efficient fleets across Europe. Since our collaboration with Google Cloud, we elevate our passenger experience by improving our hub steering and avoiding misconnections. By this, we have an impact also on our sustainability by increasing the efficiency of our operations. With the Operations Decision Support Suite, or OpsD as we call it, we want to make better decisions when it comes to optimizing our operations day by day. Google Cloud's professional service organization was really a game changer in the way we started the project. Since partnering with Google Cloud, we managed to achieve 1.5 million of Swiss francs of savings back in 2021. We are optimizing our tail oil location by always sending the most efficient aircraft on the respective route. Working in the airline industry, it's very important to also bear in mind our CO2 footprint. On one side, obviously we want to reduce it, but on the other side, we also want to link people and economies. 
Google Cloud helps us reducing our ecological footprint with the help of new technologies. This provides decision support for our ops controllers, taking smarter decisions, faster decisions. In a customer-centric business, it's obviously important that whatever we do, it has a positive impact on our customers. When it comes to performance, when we need to load data in, in milliseconds due to changing conditions, we use different tools across the Lufthansa Group. Some of the solutions that we're enjoying from Google Cloud is the BigQuery, Vertex AI, and the operations research capabilities. Together with the innovative technology of Google Cloud and the extensive know-how of how to operate airplanes at Swiss, we brought together the best of both worlds by optimizing our operations in the future. The future in our context looks pretty exciting because we are starting today and implementing our tools as Swiss and we are planning to roll out, of course, everything to our Lufthansa Group Airlines. And that makes us really proud. Welcome everyone, my name is Chad Jennings and I'm a product manager in data analytics and I'm the geospatial analytics lead for Google Cloud. And I'm honored to be joined today by Eric Malia, who's the vice president for sustainability business solutions at Geotab and Shane Moldenhauer, who's the senior manager um, at the and the electrified product lead for Deloitte Canada. So gentlemen, before we get into the details of sustainability and vehicles, let's put this whole thing into context. How does vehicle and fleet management stack in the global set of climate and sustainability activities? I'll take that one, Chad. Um, if you look at this from a global perspective, you know we're emitting about 8 billion tons worth of CO2 a year globally. Uh, of that, 24% is attributed to transportation alone. Okay, so you know, quick on the fly mathematics, we're talking about 2 billion tons of CO2. All right. That, that checks the impactful box. Um, and so, you know, Eric, the question to you, um, you, you know, governments all over the world have enacted or are enacting uh, regulations to limit CO2 emissions. How are customers balancing their strategies to meet those regulatory requirements while ensuring that their fleets still do what their fleets need to do? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. In fact, we see a lot of motivators and drivers around decarbonization of fleet operations. You mentioned one, certainly government regulations and, and uh, the fleet industry knows that that's gonna put pressure on them to reduce their, their carbon emissions from their vehicles. But uh, some organizations, particularly in the private sector, are realizing that uh, committing to sustainability and reducing carbon in their fleet could really be a competitive advantage for them. It offers cost reduction opportunities. It also offers uh, you know, top line benefits and showing the world that they take sustainability seriously. You know, as it relates to telematics and helping them in that journey, you know, telematics is great at helping fleets uh, identify GHG emission baselines, uh, know where reduction opportunities exist, track progress, and celebrate successes when they when they hit certain milestones. So, Geotab really we think about from a carbon reduction perspective, you know, three core areas and how. Uh, a fleet may tackle that. One is uh, getting more fuel efficient or more efficient vehicles into the fleet. The second is operating existing vehicles more efficiently. And the third finally is just doing more with less. So that could be uh, right sizing a vehicle to the application or right sizing the fleet so that you have fewer vehicles doing more jobs. You can get more efficient vehicles in there and get a better payback on the capital expenditure of those more efficient vehicles. You know, and I like how you're stacking those, right? There's some like very high level ones, like let's be more efficient. And then there's some much more detailed items in there, like, you know, let's right size, let's use a small vehicle for something that's appropriate for a small vehicle and a larger one um, for, for other tasks. Um, Shane, kind of continuing with that, like from high level to specifics, what are some specific challenges that customers are up against as they're trying to like come together and meet these sustainability goals? Yeah, so a lot of our clients, you know, both public and private, are facing just this 
uh, tsunami of, of information around what they need to do, what are some of the vehicles that they can replace into, you know, new uh, manufacturing standards, battery chemistries. It's, it's a lot of information uh, that you're having to deal with. So where we've gone and, and how we're collaborating with, uh, with partners like Geotab is leveraging some of the tools that, that Geotab have built and serving our clients with a tool called Electrified. Electrified is built in such a way that it actually will help our clients tangibly be able to uh, identify areas of their fleet to electrify, not just telling them which vehicles one for one to replace, but also the charging infrastructure required, uh, as, as well as the ongoing management of all of those electric vehicles. Well, that's, that's, that's a lot. I, I asked for specifics. I got a ton of it. Really appreciate that. Um, and then I guess question, Shane, to you first and maybe to Eric as well. Were there some best practices that you wanted to, uh, you know, to elucidate at, to meet some of those challenges? In terms of best practices, I think it's, it starts with how to, how to identify your, your sustainability goals and then get the necessary you know, leadership approval or, or, or uh, goal setting baselining in place. And then once you've got that baseline set, knowing where you want to work towards, uh, that's still a large issue. It's a large concern for many of our clients. So leveraging data, leveraging the tools that you have, Geotap is an, is an incredible tool set through their, their telematics device, but also their platform. And so leverage what you have. And in this case, uh, taking that data and, and actioning it into your business. You know, you, you mentioned understanding several times there. And honestly, that's what data and analytics is largely about. Let and I think it's germane to this next question. So let's back up a little bit. We talked about you know charts. We talked about data. We talked about you know managing the line on the chart, like with some of these uh, telematics uh, products that you just went through, like Electrified. But what about people? And Eric, this one is to you. Is like the technologies are awesome, but like how do you get people to do stuff that's different than they used to do? Like how do you get people to make these changes as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I think. When folks think about telematics data, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, what are what are my vehicles doing right now? Where are my vehicles? How are they being used? Or perhaps how do I make better decisions around operating my fleet? Um, but really the power of telematics extends even beyond that. Um, you know, using the power of telematics and, and the tools and the programs that partners like Deloitte um, can put together, we, it really can be a powerful tool for cultural change. and uh, really developing a culture around sustainability. What do I mean by that? Well, for years we've heard in the telematics industry, you know, how do we get behavior change from vehicle operators or drivers? You know, do we reward them with the carrot or discipline them with the stick? For example, if we want to see drivers reduce their their idling with their vehicles, do we create an exception report that shows here's everybody, here's all the violators, and and you know, enforce some disciplinary uh, measure around those folks, or here are the folks that are Reduce, reducing idling the most, and here's the reward for those folks. Well, the academic literature actually suggests that maybe we shouldn't do either of those things. Maybe we should use the data to really highlight the power of the change that we can create uh, from a decarbonization perspective and, and motivate folks intrinsically to want to be that change um, and create a more sustainable future for us. So I think that's the trick that we're after here. And you know, it takes a village and, and working with folks like Google and Deloitte from this type of platform and data is, is really fundamental. Yeah, I, I firmly agree. And, and I've seen in other industries, well outside of telematics, that part of the role that data analytics plays is that communication, right? Is that like, you know, hey, you know, as a community, a village, a town, a nation, a globe, we want to achieve, you know, what we're talking about here, 2 billion less tons of emissions. And so like, you know, here's how we're all doing together. And, and I've seen this, I've seen that cultural uh, design and using data and analytics to communicate and get everybody on the same page happen in multiple industries. To be honest, I think that's that one right there is one of the most interesting technical social trends of our industry. Okay, so enough of that from me. Um, we're, we're, we're coming up on time, but I wanted to take a moment here to offer a closing thought here. So Eric, let me let me pose this question to you. What do you feel that the future holds for telematics, vehicles, and sustainability? You know, that's a great question. I think, you know, with a lot of organizations making the commitment to run 
net zero emission fleets in the future by a certain year that they're determining as their goal. Ultimately, there's going to be massive electrification of the transportation industry and the fleet industry. And really, there's three challenges that, that we are aware of as it relates categorically to electrifying a fleet. One is figuring out how to go electric, and lots of fleets are doing that, um, and, and Shane's described the way to do that with their electrified tool. Another one is, how do I operate electric vehicles in my fleet? You know, how do I have the data to know uh, what's happening with those vehicles in real time? Are they being charged? What's the state charge? But really, the, the next frontier that we haven't really addressed is, how do I scale electric vehicles? You know, how do I have all these vehicles coming back into a depot, for example, and needing to charge at the same time? How do I balance managing the charging needs and integration with the grid and the vehicle availability and the fleet needs for operating uh, their organization? So telematics is going to be front and center in, in addressing that challenge as we scale. And I look forward to addressing that together with our partners and with our customers. Yeah, splendid. We'll, we'll, we'll have those be the last words of the session. No, excellently done. So thank you, gentlemen, both for joining us here and sharing your opinions and your insights. Thank you also for the work you're doing, right? Two billion tons, that's important stuff. And so with that, thank you for watching and thank you for staying with us till the very end. Take care. joining our session on the path to 24-7 carbon-free energy. We'll walk you through the what, the why, the how, and in particular, how any organisation can join the 24-7 CFE movement. My name is Charlotte Hutchinson, and I'm a technical program manager on Google's data and software climate solutions team. I'll hand it off to my colleague, Savannah. Thanks, Charlotte. My name is Savannah Goodman, and I lead our data and software climate solutions team. So let's jump into the what and the why. Many companies have been striving for 100% renewable energy in order to reduce their emissions from electricity consumption. In fact, Google accomplished this goal in 2017 and has been achieving 100% RE every year since then. While 100% RE targets have been a fantastic way to drive investment in solar and wind energy across the globe, it doesn't fundamentally solve the problem of decarbonizing every electric grid. 100% RE means matching our annual consumption with renewable energy we procure around the globe. In this example, even though we're procuring enough renewable energy in Iowa, which is shown by the green in this graph, to match our consumption at our data center in that region, there are still many hours where we are relying on fossil energy, as shown by the black. That is why we have set a 24-7 carbon-free energy target by 2030. So what do we mean by 24-7 carbon-free energy? We've expanded beyond the typical renewables, such as wind, solar, and geothermal, to also include biomass in certain situations, nuclear and hydro energy that's on the grid, and pump storage or battery storage discharge. Having a diverse portfolio of technologies is key to enabling 24-7 CFE. The way we calculate 24-7 CFE is for each region we operate in. We look at every hour of our consumption and try to match that hour with carbon-free energy that's on the grid in addition to the new carbon-free energy projects that Google invests in. Here's that same Iowa data center where the top graph shows the carbon-free energy that's already on the grid on an hourly basis. When averaging the CFE across the year, we get a score of 32%. Once we add the carbon-free energy that Google has procured, we get to an average of 93% CFE across the year. So the goal is to get to 100% in every region. So why is this new approach so important? We know that to curb the worst effects of climate change, we need to achieve a net zero emissions global economy. One key lever to, is to create zero carbon electricity system at an accelerated rate. 24-7 CFE helps us do just that. It is a transformative approach to, 
into energy purchasing, supply contracting, and policy implementation designed to accelerate the end state of a fully decarbonized electricity system. A recent study done by Princeton University demonstrates the specific benefits of 24-7 CFE. The results of this study include a buyer can eliminate CO2 emissions associated with their consumption. Second, 24-7 CFE leads to greater system level emissions reductions, especially when hourly matching is sufficiently high. It also drives early deployment of advanced CFE technologies, including clean firm generation and advanced energy storage. 24-7 CFE also drives significantly more retirement of fossil fuel capacity. This means that clean firm generation and 24-7 portfolios have a greater substitution value for capacity than natural gas. Finally, 24-7 CFE, while it does come at a cost premium to 100% RE annual matching, the premium is significantly reduced by utilizing a full portfolio of carbon-free energy technologies. There are also other financial benefits to 24-7, including improved hedging against basis and shape risk. Now I'll pass it off to Charlotte to go through the how of 24-7. Thanks, Savannah. At the heart of solving this problem is data. Data is foundational to us meeting our 24-7 aim by 2030. The key challenges we're facing around data are relevance, ensuring that you have the right data from a range of different sources in all the areas that you operate in. Consistency, as the data is constantly evolving, we need to ensure that it is consistent and to a high quality. And then finally, transparency. It is vital to get the source of truth and the data in one place to be able to trust the outputs of the analysis. We're approaching 24-7 carbon-free energy in three steps. Firstly, collect and transform. This is breaking down the silos and getting access to the data and storing it in one single place. Next, getting the data into the correct format and running the an analytics on top of this. Finally, execution and using the data to get real actionable insights. So what are we actually doing? We're working together with our partners to help our customers drive insights on a 24-7 carbon-free energy. We're running a 24-7 CFE evaluation pilot with our customers. This comprises of three main phases. Phase one, ingesting hourly production, production and consumption data to understand your baseline and to get your current 24-7 CFE score. This enables you to see the gaps and to understand where the opportunities are. Phase two, run a 24-7 economic assessment on your data and understand how to optimize and improve your CFE score with a range of different scenarios. We can then use this to identify and understand where you will have the most impact. Phase three is the execution phase. This is working with your company to set your 24-7 targets and help and understand how you can purchase PPAs based on the results of phase two. So what is the value from the pilot? Firstly, as I've mentioned before, you can get an energy baseline and understand where you are at on your 24-7 journey. Secondly, financially, it allows you to see the benefits of 24-7 and to understand basis risk and you reduce your exposure to volatile wholesale prices. Thirdly, we're incorporating our partners across Google Cloud ecosystem to allow you to get a streamlined process to efficiently and effectively monitor and analyze your CFE score over time. And then finally, this allows you to get ahead of reporting changes and allows you to get more of a granular visibility of your emissions accounting. I'll now hand it back to Savannah to talk you through how you can join the movement. Thanks, Charlotte. To set some context, we recognize that getting to true 24-7 carbon-free energy is a journey. And at Google, we started this journey by first offsetting our emissions to become operationally carbon neutral, and we've been doing that since 2007. Then it took us another decade to achieve 100% renewable energy. And now we have a little less than a decade to achieve our next goal of reaching 24-7 carbon-free energy in every region we operate. Our 24-7 goal is the anchor to achieving our net zero target, which we've also set for 2030. And we're not the only ones working towards 24-7 CFE. In fact, to enable 24-7 carbon-free energy in every grid, we need a diverse set of stakeholders to come together, including corporate buyers, policymakers, governments, NGOs, and solutions providers. There are over 70 signatories who've signed on to the UN 24-7 Carbon-Free Energy Compact to date. 
They are committed to accelerating the tools needed to collectively realize 24-7 CFE for everyone. That's why we are inviting you to join the movement. You can take the first steps by signing on to the Compact, where you can learn more about 24-7 CFE and collaborate with other stakeholders to chart your path there. In addition, you can sign up to participate in the 24-7 CFE evaluation pilot that Charlotte described, so you can understand what 24-7 CFE means for you. Finally, you can adopt a 24-7 CFE goal for your own operations as a way to drive, drive towards net zero. To register your to register your interest in participating, please go to g.co slash cloud slash 24-7 CFE. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the Sustainability Summit. everyone and thanks for joining us today. I'm Jen Bennett. I lead our technology strategy for sustainability in the office of the CTO and I am thrilled to be joined today by Andrew Friedman. He is an award-winning climate and environmental journalist who has served as a reporter and an editor for Climate Central, the Washington Post, and is currently the climate and energy reporter at Axios. Uh, Andrew holds dual master's degrees in climate science, as well as international relations from Columbia and the Fletcher School at Tufts. So I am actually thrilled today because I am on the other side and Andrew will be answering my questions for once. So welcome, Andrew. Thanks for having me, Jen. Wonderful. Um, we are gonna be exploring today what makes for credible corporate climate action. And I have a lot of questions for you, so hopefully you're ready. Um, I know that you've been covering this topic quite a bit and thinking about it. Earlier this year, year, you covered our report that we did that gauged executives' views on prioritization, challenges, and opportunities around sustainability. And what the results showed us is that large companies are around the world are really prioritizing sustainability and they feel good about their progress. Um, however, on the other side, uh, many of those same corporate leaders still feel like there's some green hypocrisy that exists, and in fact, that they may be overstating their sustainability progress. So I wanted to ask you, as a journalist, how do you parse through the increasing noise to really highlight what's really impactful? So the noise level really is uh, uh, something that we deal with on a daily basis in our newsroom. Um, it is a challenge to uh, sift through all the press releases, all the reports, all the nuggets that we're getting uh, through our sources. But really what we're looking for are a couple of things. One is uh, are our companies, uh, is a company's progress on reducing greenhouse gas emissions or some other goal that they have set tangible? Um, are they verifiable and reportable? Uh, how so? According to which uh, mechanism, uh, you know, which framework or rubric, if you will? Um, are they saying one thing and doing another? So are they, uh, you know, talking the talk? sort of walk in the walk and also giving money to politicians who are advocating for policies that don't really fit with that agenda um, or to groups uh, whose advocacy work uh, doesn't fit with that agenda. And we see that a lot, that type of hypocrisy, because there's a lot of interests at play in Washington. Uh, corporations have a lot of interests involved 
and sometimes sustainability is not the number one thing uh, when it gets when it comes down to K Street. That's great. Do you, you know, when you report, do you feel a responsibility to maybe highlight some work over others? Yeah, you know, I, I feel there's there's a responsibility to, I think, ask myself uh, at the beginning of going into a story, uh, what does the science say needs to be happening? Uh, and how can I get that across or compare that to what is actually happening here? Um, so where the science says we need to be going and are these companies acting with that science in mind? Um, and approaching the government, uh, government action in the same way. Uh, that helps set a little bit of a North Star, um, you know, framework. So I'm not uh, totally lost in this void of, uh, you know, PR spin, but but really kind of grounding myself in uh, the knowledge of, of where we need to go on this issue. Uh, the fact that, you know, things are not exactly uh, moving fast enough at the government level and that corporations have a major role to play in uh, reducing emissions, in uh, advancing innovative solutions, uh, in showing uh, cities and municipalities uh, how to get things done and partnering in unique ways. So really, like, I I'm trying to look at, at kind of measuring, um, you know, where this company is, what this program means that they're announcing or I'm writing about, and how it fits in with the larger picture. Yeah, you, measure, you mentioned science quite a few times. Um, you know, when I think about science, I start to think about transparency. And one of the areas that I'm really excited about is the proliferation of satellites and sensors, um, you know, which enables us to really view and observe the earth globally, understand the impacts that we're having, you know, and look at climate change and how that's impacting our businesses. Um, in fact, I was really fortunate um, to be invited to the Jason 3 launch back in 2016. And what I was really inspired by was the satellite's mission to support scientific, commercial, and also practical applications related to sea level rise, ocean circulation, um, and climate change as a, as a whole. You know, since then, if you look, the number of satellites and the proliferation, it's, it's really just grown exponentially, hockey stick. So um, maybe, maybe you could share with us, what technology have you seen that provides that kind of transparency, you know, that scientific evidence that we need for climate action and for the transparency of, of you know, or proof of, of evidence of what is actually happening? Well, I would actually just ag agree with you on that. Like one of the things that, that I've been paying really close attention to is uh, these sort of watchdog groups that are uh, that are being established uh, through uh, networks of satellites. So you have uh, nonprofit environmental groups launching their own methane detection satellites. You have for-profit companies doing the same thing and selling the data. You have uh, initiatives to track greenhouse gases from space, both from NASA as well as uh, private uh, initiatives. Um, new instruments that are going up on satellites from Planet and from other companies. So we have designed this international climate treaty system with no enforcement mechanism. You know, it, it's all sort of on the honor system. And we know from reporting that the emissions that are being reported by countries are not exactly accurate. Um, they're predominantly underestimated. And we can finally say, well, wait a minute here. Maybe these satellite networks are going to be kind of an either, either a name and shame the polluter sort of system where you put pressure on companies that own, you know, methane super polluting facilities um, or are better able to track, uh, you know, some companies' uh, impacts on the Amazon, for example, or the palm oil, you know, trade. Um, or you're better able to just really track uh, progress towards the Paris goals. 
uh, that 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 was not something that I would have even thought of uh, in Paris in 2015. And it's something that I had only really begun to think of uh, in, in Glasgow. Uh, and it was something that was heavily emphasized by officials there, especially on the methane front. Yeah. Um, I know we're we're coming up on time here, but maybe uh, not to give away any secrets, but what's one question that you always make sure to ask to ensure that actions that companies are taking today are actually making the change for tomorrow? You know, I, I usually ask um, how confident you are, so just the person I'm talking to, uh, that this is really going to make a difference. Um, or is this just, you know, another incremental step or uh, some sort of PR spin? Um, you have to ask that question because as your survey showed, you know, a lot of corporate leaders see, see their company acting, are proud of it, but at the same time, think that their company may be guilty of greenwashing and overestimating their own progress. So there's kind of this duality to, to executives' views that I think is important to tease out. Yeah, that's great. I know this was short, probably many more things we could talk about, but I really wanted to thank you, Andrew, for joining me today and thank all of those who joined. I hope you're as inspired as I am to continue to move to impactful action. Thank you once again. Today, we saw just how impactful technology can be in the fight against climate change. We also saw how innovation can happen in any part of an organization. And we saw how collaboration across industries, across partners, and across the public and private sectors can accelerate sustainable change. At Google, we are committed to helping make the sustainable choice the easiest choice for all our customers and users. We hope today inspired you to act, and we are excited to see what you build next. Thank you so much.